This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after 10 is the time. A very good morning indeed to you. It's Thursday, so don't forget Mystery Hour is on the way. Um, In the second hour of the programme, we may turn our attention, unless you've got a better idea, to, which by the way is perfectly plausible, to plans in Australia to ban teenagers from social media. A story we've circled around so many times, and yet one of the headlines today pinpoints precisely our interest in it. Nobody knows, says the headline, whether it will work or not. Do you reckon you do? Uh, But we begin, I think, inevitably with the speech that uh, Keir Starmer is due to give imminently, which uh, will contain his response to the uh, reported £37 billion shortfall in NHS funding since 2010. That's the finding of the former... Health Minister Lord Darcy, um, he will talk about reform, but of course uh, that will only be part of the story. I, I, I find myself reeling in part from the speed of the decline. So the NHS I don't think has ever been, well has it, do you think? This isn't necessarily the phone-in topic, but do you think the NHS has ever been close to perfect, That the nearest thing to perfect? I mean, supremely fit for purpose. Remember, there will be people listening to this program who've worked for the NHS for decades, who've watched them in and watched them out, who remember that in 2010, although this isn't quite the bulldozer of a statistic that it initially appears to be, because the records don't go back forever, but patient satisfaction with the NHS in 2010, when David Cameron, currently busy washing his hands of all responsibility for the Grenfell Terror tragedy, which, of course, Sir Martin Morbick put down in part to so-called deregulation, or as David Cameron preferred to call such matters, bonfire of the red tape. Um, he introduced austerity in 2010, and in just 14 short years, we've gone from the highest recorded levels of patient satisfaction to the phrase reform or die and a decade to fix our our broken NHS. I I don't think there's much debate here, although I am... Do you know, I told you, didn't I? I was a little worried about how things were going to shake down once we were being governed by people who at least intended to do their best by the country. Do you remember how naively... I used to be uh, naively optimistic. I used to be the curse of O'Brien, so desperate for politicians to actually be dedicated to improving our country that I ended up saying nice things. Oh, man, this is embarrassing. If you're relatively new to the program, you may find this a little hard to believe, but over, over the last few years, I have said nice things about everybody from Matt Hancock to James Cleverly. It became known, indeed. Well, at least I started. I don't know if anyone else did, but I, I started calling it the... Uh, the curse of O'Brien, because every time I said something warm, even Rishi Sunak, for a couple of hours on the day of his enthronement, I thought he meant it when he talked about integrity, professionalism and accountability. And then, of course, he put Suella Braverman back in the Home Office and destroyed any hope of um, uh, being remembered for any of those three things. And, and, uh, and, and the same is true now, although the speed with which the Labour Party let us down, if indeed they let us down, will be as nothing compared to the speed with which the likes of Sunak and uh, and Hancock and Cleverly have, have let us down. But it's a patriotic impulse, optimism, wanting the best for your country, wanting them to do well. And you know I was a little worried about what we would do together and how we'd spend our time together uh, when we were being governed by people who were clearly doing their, had their country's best interests at heart and were not either corrupt or incompetent. Uh, Boris Johnson and Liz Truss both became Prime Minister, I would remind you. So neither corrupt nor incompetent. What on earth are we going to talk about every day? But the uh, uh, question has already been answered. Uh, Mad people on the right wing of the media are going to continue behaving as if up is down, black is white, and, um, and yes is no. So it is clear that the problems in the NHS are caused by years of underfunding, 14 years of underfunding, which is why the Daily Telegraph has to print a story about there being more money spent on the NHS than ever before. Um, but, but, the, uh, but the performance is worse, uh, conveniently ignoring one of the biggest reasons why, which is the sort of collapse in social care and the failure of successive Tory governments to get a handle on proper social care coupled with austerity, so people stuck in hospital who simply shouldn't be there, contribute to every other problem from which the NHS suffers. 
And yes, Mr. P, uh, you ask in a text, the um, the curse of O'Brien may well extend to the current government, may well extend to Labour politicians, but largely speaking, so far, so good. Um, the biggest challenge that they have, of course, is to make the rest of us understand that there are that winter is coming. There are hard times ahead, that fixing all the things that are broken. I heard Carol Vorderman's interview with Nick earlier. I'm delighted to tell you that I'm one of the people in the back of Carol's book who she suggests you should be paying even more attention to than you do already. Um, uh, th there are broken institutions. The country in many ways is broken in many ways. Uh, someone should write a book about that. And he has to, I think, starting with the pensioners, he has to drive home the point that everybody's going to have to put their shoulder to the wheel. But as he said earlier this year, it is those with the broadest shoulders that must carry the heaviest burden. And that's why some people with broad shoulders are sounding so spooked by the prospect of a budget, up to and including pretending that the £22 billion shortfall is something that the government should be explaining before the budget for reasons that currently elude me, because no one's ever demanded that of a government before. So as we wait to see what's going to happen, we assemble an almost endless list of things that need to be addressed. Um, let me tell you some of the stuff that Lord Darcy has said. The NHS is broken. The NHS is broken, but it is completely reversible. The vital signs are stable. We just need to put the right investment in the NHS. There's a £37 billion shortfall in buildings and equipment. I know what you're thinking. What happened to all those hospitals that Boris Johnson promised to build? Well, I'll give you a little clue, a little spoiler alert. They went in exactly the same direction as all the other promises that Boris Johnson made, up to and including the brilliance of Brexit. Um, he said that if that £37 billion had been spent over the last <clears throat> 14 years, then every GP practice would have been refurbished. They would all be replete with up-to-date kit. The 40 new hospitals uh, that were promised would have been built. And instead... We're left with crumbling buildings and decrepit porter cabins. Uh, it's partly a hangover from funding. In his words, 2010 was the start of that. Um, he's also pretty scathing about a shake-up of NHS structures in 2012. Again, back to David Cameron, calling it a calamity without international precedent. I keep a little folder. Uh, we've just ordered it from stationery. I'm tempted to order lots of things from stationery. It makes me... I, do you know, one of the things of my childhood that I remember most fondly was going to visit Dad in his office in Birmingham and cleaning out the stationery cupboard. I used to... I, I, used to, I used to be amazing. He was the only editorial member of staff in Birmingham for the Daily Telegraph. The bloke that ran advertising was in the next office next door. There's two offices and one secretary, one PA. The bloke who ran advertising had much better booty because he'd be giving it to potential customers to buy adverts in the paper. So he, if, I, if he was in there when I went to see Dad, and Mum used to take us to see Dad when we were out shopping in Birmingham, he'd have like branded golf balls and umbrellas and cool stuff like that. Dad just had a stationary cupboard. But I still have a sort of curious relationship with stationary cupboards. Post-it notes and probably my new jam. But what we've done is all, we've ordered some old school folders like document wallets made of cardboard. You can't order them in ones. You can only order them in portions of 80. So I've got 79. If you need a document wallet, let me know. I've got them coming out of my ears. I want to start experimenting with what else we can order. Do you know what I really fancy? Some hole punch reinforcements. Do you remember those? They were the coolest thing. Do you remember having hole punch reinforcements at school? It was one of those things you could do instead of actually doing any work. You could reinforce all your A4 punched hole paper to put it in your full scap folder with the clicky metal things. Do you remember all that? I used to love that. Hole punch reinforcements. That's the, that's the mother load. That's the mother load of stationary booty, isn't it? Hole punch. But anyway, I've got some cardboard wallets because what I do is I put stories in them that I haven't got around to telling you about but think that I must do soon. And one of the stories I filed away recently was about young people increasingly going private. And the reason they were doing it is because they don't have this legacy that we have with the NHS. They look at the options available and someone says, I'll tell you what, slip us 50 quid and you can get seen tomorrow or even today. And they go, well, yeah, all right. They don't feel that they're somehow betraying Nye Bevan by doing that or somehow hastening the uh, end of the NHS as we know it. It's probably what the free market vampires have been banking on for years, is that a new generation with a broken NHS will be more likely to look at their options and go private, which of course contributes in some ways to the breaking of the NHS. And 
that's a story I didn't bring to your attention, despite having my shiny new document wallet, full scap document wallet. But it, it struck me as a moment. It struck me as a stepping stone on the path to unknown territory, unknown, uncharted waters. And that's where the NHS is now. It's in uncharted waters. And I want to begin with the why of it. You, you as someone in it, at whatever level, why? It, it's easy to talk about funding, but what does that actually mean on your ward? What does that mean in your GP surgery? What does it mean in your hospital or your office? What does it actually mean when Lord Darcy talks about a £37 billion shortfall in buildings and equipment? What did that do to your job? And how has it affected your ability to look after the rest of us? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. So we know that the challenge is huge. We know that Keir Starmer is currently, as I, as I speak, he is delivering a speech in which he vows to repair the devastating damage inflicted on the NHS by years of Tory underfunding and savage cuts. You know that the usual suspects in the media will either deny that the cuts are responsible for the disaster, pretend that the fact that the NHS um, still receives a heck of a lot of money, more than ever before, is somehow proof that it's got nothing to do with cuts while completely ignoring the reality of social care and sundry other issues you know that the, the, the friends of the Tories the Tory media will also um, uh, deny probably even that it's broken but you know that it is because you work in it and you know at least in part at least in part how it was broken and what those breaks have done so if you hit the numbers now, we will speak imminently. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. How, how, what, what does the breaking look like? And how has it affected what you can do for the rest of us? Just for the record, if, you, if you're new to the program, this is, this is a place that really, really fights shy of, of bashing the NHS. It's a, it's a place that recognises the enormous effort. I'll tell you what it is. It's a place that recognises that if it wasn't for the goodwill, particularly of, of hospital doctors and nurses, if it wasn't for the fact that they're prepared to go the extra mile, to work unpaid, to skip their breaks, to do things that aren't necessarily part of their brief, we recognise that if it wasn't for you doing that, things would be a million times worse, immeasurably worse than Lord Darcy explains today they already are. So I don't, I don't really like anything that smacks of individual criticism. But institutional criticism, that's an absolutely essential part of a functioning democracy. So in 2010, patient satisfaction with the NHS was the highest it has ever, possibly will ever be. 14 years later, it's in existential peril. It is in danger of dying. It is broken. Why? How? And what can you tell the rest of us? 0345 6060 It's 1016. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 1019. It is in a parlous state and some of the answers to the question of why are fairly easy to predict but not all of them and it's the it's the latter category that i'm hoping to canvas this morning so why why is the nhs in such a mess and how does that impact upon your ability to do your job which in some way shape or form involves looking after the rest of us lucy's in mexpra lucy what would you like to say hi james hello lucy hi um yeah i'm an operating department practitioner and I work for an NHS trust in South Yorkshire. Um, I used to work at a very busy NHS trust. And um, it really affected everything. My mental health, um, you know, my work ethic, the staff morale. How do you mean? Because of, sh because of staff shortages. Oh, yeah. Um, so in the trust where I work, there was always people that had been there for years and years and years. And um, they were coming up to retirement. And then COVID hit and they just gave up. They just packed in. And um, basically it left a big staff shortage. And, 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 no, um, and, and, and no 
infrastructure in place to fill the holes no no sort of uh, what do they call it learning and development investment yeah. to make sure that people yeah. were coming up behind the ones that just burnt yeah. out during covid exactly and then we were left with a backlog of operations so you've heard about the waiting list um because i work in theaters where we do the operations and the list and people were waiting for the hip replacement or the knee replacement and they'd be waiting like two years and the reason is you couldn't get the staff the staff would be off sick the amount of staff that are off sick with mental health issues some have been diagnosed with cancer because during covid they couldn't get an appointment um, and what's happened is that they employ agency staff and agency staff are brilliant they come and they pick up the shifts that the trust can't fill that the list and the operations that the trusts can't perform without the manpower. But they cost twice as much. They do. And they allow so, and they contribute to the apparent anomaly of funding for the NHS going up while service goes down. So uh, you really have to squint or indeed close your eyes to miss the point. But many people are determined to do so. Is there a tipping point? Uh, you mentioned COVID. Uh, obviously... Lord Darcy's analysis sees 2010 as a starting point, 2012 as a, as a particular problem, that, that restructuring that, that um, he describes in fairly negative terms. But for you, uh, was it, was it that the during and post-pandemic that things went from difficult but doable to close to undoable? Um, or not? Well, I mean, when was it? If you had to pick a pivot point where you thought, that sounds like a tongue twister, doesn't it? Pick a pivot point, you know please. Go on. Do you know what? what? What I will be brutally honest and say is, for a lot of NHS staff working in theatres, the tipping point does not exist <laughs> because they are so they are such workers. Anybody who works in an operating department will yeah. tell you it's hard work. Your normal day is eight while six. Uh, we do not stop. And that is the ethos and that is the passion <laughs> of of theatres and surgeons and anaesthetists and a lot of what has happened is people have not gone on on sick as such but they've left the trust that they were always part of pre-covid and they've gone to work for agencies they've gone to the other side so to speak yeah. but they are getting 30 40 pound an hour so i know some uh, scrub nurses that will that have reduced their hours at their normal trust and they'll go and work maybe somewhere else at a private clinic doing ophthalmics Four hundred pounds for the day, which wouldn't matter <laughs> if there was a, an abundance of nursing staff and or yeah. a, a, a sensible attitude to immigration. But of course, we have neither in this country, so it's it's, it's the it's the worst of all I possible what, worlds. Even, Go on. I tell you what I find in my practice, which is quite worrying, mm. is that when we do get um, patients in that don't speak English, there's like no way we can get interpreters sometimes and we're not meant to use the family member as an interpreter it's it's not good practice so you end up having to yeah well or we'll say we can't do it it's not safe because if you're in an anesthetic room bringing a needle to somebody or wanting to put a cannula in and they do not understand what you are having what they're having done how can you in good conscience say that's good care? Well, it's, not, it's, it's not It's not. consensual. It's not, uh, it's it's not, not. consensual. I, is, go on quickly. The, the thing is that we're saying, oh, no, but we need to get this patient done. Yeah. They'll do everything not to cancel a patient because doing a patient and doing the surgery means money, money for the trust. So they will work and work and work their employees until until they go off sick. And then that's, and then why, that's why people are going, do you know what you've just described to me? You've just described a boat that has a leak. And the people in the oh, boat, yeah. the people in but the boat what, have James? no choice but to carry. If you stop bailing out that water, it will. So you just but, have to keep bailing out the water. Yeah, but who's asking the NHS employees? They don't. They don't speak out because. Well, I am. They're dead. It's kind of, <laughs> well, it's kind of in- institutionalisation as well, though. And I, I would say it's borderline um, employment gaslighting. You're supposed to care, so you should stay past. Six well, I did. I tried to, you know, I, that's that's why I was at such pains in my introduction to say that we don't do the bashing on this program. We recognise that if it wasn't for people doing more than their job description demands or more than their health allows, then the NHS would be in, in even more trouble than it is already. Indeed, um, up to and including the, the, the analogy of the boat full of water, filling with water. That's what that's what Lucy and her colleagues do every day. If they don't keep bucketing the water out of the boat, then we're all and we're all on it. We're all on it. 
but they're the ones that are bailing the water out. And then, then the boat will say, I've gone a bit analogy mad this week, haven't I? But so far, I think they've worked quite well. They all involve water. With the, with the winter fuel, no, with the prison places, it was the pint pot and the shot glass. If you missed it, you can listen back on Global Player. And now with the NHS, it's the, it's the leaky boat. Uh, Lucy, that was a brilliant start. Absolutely brilliant. And in fact, I remember when I started this job, um, uh, uh, the idea of the NHS providing translators was one of the early signs of, of the sort of growing, um, uh, what would you call it, racist rhetoric that was beginning to grip the country uh, you know e even strong accents were supposed to be a problem in the nhs and and that's why you, you you need to have people being treated that's what the nhs is for ryan is in liverpool ryan what would you like to say james um i worked for the nhs um as a finance analyst and um, i had two roles in particular. One was looking after NHSP, which is, deals with the bank and agency costs. Now, bank is if you're an NHS staff member, you can pick up bank shifts across different areas. Yeah. And agency speaks for itself. So I got to see high water and amounts on a weekly basis. We were paying out for agency um, staff members across the different wards. Um, and another is... Um, why are, the, why are those oh. figures eye-watering? I, I mean, how, talk me through the economics of it. If I said I'm not going to pay more than this, people... Well, I think, yeah. you, you have to. Oh, mate, <laughs> the phone line's terrible. I don't know what's happened there, but uh, that's like torture, isn't it? When, the, when, the, when it goes like that. They're just... Of all the things that can go wrong with the phone line, I think the worst thing is when the phone line's pretty clear and then it just has those little punctuations of silence. <laughs> That we're trying to get him back. Paul's in Southampton. Paul, what made you pick up the phone? Uh, hi, James. Uh, yeah, uh, I've, I've been listening to, uh, to your show uh, for quite a while. Thank you. Um, my, my background has been uh, working in healthcare analytics. Uh, I, work, I work in population health analytics. I've got postgrads in population health, okay. health economics. Wow. Um, I, I kind of fell into the NHS. Yeah. Um, now, now what, what we talk about in issues with, with, with the NHS um, the, the the inflation the NHS incurs has always been much higher than CPI and RPI why? Uh, um, I'll break that down because um, the new drugs new, new drugs need, need R&D yeah. uh, new drugs cost more and they're better that's the idea uh, better value they, cost... they get through nice well how could, if they're better value why would that drive up inflation? Well, 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 it's a it's a cost the NHS incurs. Yeah, the so they're not so they're not yeah. better value. Well, uh, no, well, well, I'm not I'm not well, picking nice. holes in what yeah. you're saying. I'm, I'm coming from a position of ignorance when I'm always at my most yeah. curious. But they can't be better yeah. if they were better value. Inflation would come down. Um, health economics is is not the same as normal economics. No, um, you don't you, you don't um, plan to choose to use healthcare um, resourcing. Um, so, so, yeah, so that's you don't not, know. Uh, well, I mean, some people think you can, of course, and that's that's perhaps yeah. another another problem. So, yeah, I, I mean, we so, can't, we can't, you can't bring CPI into it and then say we can't be talking about normal economics. So, what, what, what? If if you had to fix the problem that you're describing, what would be a way to do that? Uh, well, there you go. So, so, so without we have increased demand, uh, workforce issues, which is what your previous calls yeah. you can talk about as well. Now. Now, I remember when I first started it in the NHS in 2009, uh, I worked for an arm's length body. Uh, looking at <laughs> you could say an arms dealer then. I don't know where that came from in my head. What? Yes, what's um, an arm's length body? You're using a lot of lingo, Paul, because this is your day job, but it's not ours. Sorry, sorry. That's it's all right. It's a quangate, basically. Okay, a quangate. Uh, it, it was an NHS body where he looked at supply and demand for different specialties and professions. Yeah. So, so, and I, I, I looked at surgical specialties. Now, now on the supply side, you have how many, how many people you got in the moment, how many people, people you got coming in through training, how many people work you got working part time, how many people are going to retire, all those kind of things. Look at the supply and then demands, uh, you know, the increase in demand for, for the different surgical and stuff. Now, now with this, I remember at the time uh, coming into it, uh, fresh face into the NHS. I was just like, wow, you know, kind of, I didn't realise it was it was five years medical school, two years foundation training, then three to eight years specialist training on top of that. So I, don't, talking, I, don't, I don't, I don't know what you're telling me. What, what, what I'm saying is, sorry, yeah. just get the point. That's all right, man. No, I know it can um, be nerve wracking coming it, on the radio, but I'm late costs, for the news. So, oh, sorry, it costs 
it costs over half a million pounds of taxpayer funding to training per person. Yeah. There is no there is no training contract. So people can get trained up and then go, Thank you very much, I'm off to work for Booper. There's Got no it. training contract. Okay. So we so we lose staff. Yeah, and, and I would have thought more importantly, we spend three point four six billion pounds a year on agency staff and, and that would amount to, according to to one cal- calculation, thirty one thousand permanent full time equivalent nurses. And of course with the uh so I, I I did I mean, I think we're both right. Politically, I've got a bigger problem with the people making a profit out of the agencies who aren't actually doing the nursing, the people who sit there and get a reward simply for being rich enough to invest in it in the first place, as opposed to the people who are free to take their labour wherever they want to take it. And I don't know, are the the wages that much higher in the private sector? Because if they are, that's another problem on the horizon for the Labour Party. Uh, Giving giving, um, pay rises to staff is another stick with which they get beaten by the usual suspects, the people who brought you Brexit, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak, and austerity. 10.31 is the time. Paul, thank you. I hope you don't feel harried, but I was conscious of the time and I was struggling to keep up with your explanation. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10.34. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Lucy gave a brilliant description of her work, James, says Julia. I was an NHS nurse working in a, oh Lord, hemodialysis. There we go, until a year ago. I was one of those approaching retirement when COVID hit. It was hell. I I got through it, but at 62, I just thought I've had enough. If there wasn't the burnout of me and fellow colleagues working in those conditions, I'd have carried on in the career I love, but I just couldn't keep going. Um, and have the luxury of retirement. Since I retired, three other nurses have done the same, and the dialysis unit is struggling to take extra staff now. Well, I mean, all you can say in response to that is thank you for your service, if that's the correct word to use, and thank God that we haven't got uh, political rhetoric afoot at the moment that seeks to demonise all immigrants, because that would make absolutely everything worse, wouldn't it? Thank God Keir Starmer is uh, not banging on about boats and breaking gangs. Oh, sorry, he is, isn't he? Yeah. Keir Starmer at some point is going to have to make the case for immigration uh, sooner rather than later, and I suspect it will come with the next round of figures, which I told you about six months ago would probably be about half. I think immigration is going to come down by 50% or so. And that is the point at which a prime minister who is cognizant of the challenges the country faces will have to explain about the relationship between demographic change, economic growth, and inviting foreign workers to come here and put their shoulders to our collective wheel. Uh, 10.36 is the time. Phil's in Manchester. Phil, what would you like to say? Oh, morning, James. Thanks Hello. for having me on. You're very um, welcome. I, I worked in the NHS for just shy of 23 years. And as an aside... In my final year of working in the operating theatres, when I left, I had 47 hours of time owing me because you don't get overtime when you stay on for goodwill. You just accrue time owing that you cannot take because you don't have enough staff to take. But that's not why I called. But it's an aside, and I completely support that first ODP who came on. Yeah, and it's an, it's, it's an enforcement of what I said about the, that what would actually happen if you all started working to rule. Yeah, but what I phoned to say was, mm. that, and it's not widely known, but the NHS logo is now a trademark. It was made a trademark, I think, about 2014, which now means that any company that the NHS employs to do their work for them yes. now carries the NHS logo on their letterhead. For an example, I got referred and to... And on their vehicles. Vacuum. And on their vehicles. Yes, exactly. But yes. I got referred to uh, an NHS uh, physiotherapy service for an injury I sustained outside of work. Yes. And when the letter came, it said, fast physio referral. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. They put me in the fast queue to get me back to work. This is brilliant. The company was called Fast Physio, but it had an NHS logo, uh, and I was thought it was an NHS service. Why is that a she problem? Some, I mean, it is an really, NHS service in the sense that the NHS are paying them to provide the service. Not the, but it's not held to the same account as if it was an internally run NHS How service. do you know that? Because they do it for money. No, I know, but, you got, but how do you know they're not held to the same account? Have we got examples of them not doing the job well and getting away with it in a way that an NHS there, 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 direct... There are plenty, of, there are plenty of, of hospitals within the northwest alone that have had um, services removed from them because they've been not fit for purpose. Yeah, well, that's being held been accountable. Well, yes, but it takes a long time. So I'm not, I'm not defending it. I don't. No, I, but no, I just no, think no, that no, the, no. I, th- I think that the part privatisation ship has sailed, and I think perhaps it sailed 
under nightfall. But it comes at a cost. It yes, of course, cost it, of course it, it comes as a cost because someone's taking a bit off the top. So, so, someone yeah. is taking a bit off the top every time a transaction happens. And the ideological exactly. response to that is, oh, yes, but it's the private sector that will bring in the efficiencies. And all they do is take a piece of the pie uh, of savings that they have made with their wonderful efficiencies. Here's a billion pounds for a management consultant. I, I, and they I, rationalise I, care a lot harder as well. Yeah. So patients won't get the care that they would have got by the NHS because the NHS is compelled to treat that patient but the private company will say actually that's going to cost us a bit too much money so what we'll do is we'll refer them back to the NHS so you're incurring double the cost to treat the one patient I get it no I get, I get all of that so how much of what you've described is reversible to use one of the words that we um, uh, hang Ooh, on no, Lord, Lord, one of Lord Darcy's words that we're all hanging on this morning I, I think that's a very very good question well, and I, do I don't my best, think there's Bill. a very easy I know I don't think there's an easy answer <laughs> right. because it's, it's crept in so slowly that it's over 40% of the NHS is run by private services now if you go to a Western hospital in the northwest. Unless you are clinical, you are employed by an external company, whether you're a porter, a secretary, receptionist, whatever, you are no longer employed, in quotes, by the NHS. You are third-party employed. Okay, that's not per se... I don't know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, yeah. but when the costs are rising and the service is not being given... And I'm not bashing so, agencies. Agencies fulfil... Well, I am bashing elements of agencies, but they fulfil they it. Because they, they charge double. So, so an yeah. agency in, the, in, in a operating theatre, for example, I did agency for a while to, to boost my income, and that was all I did it for. But say, for example, as an example, I'm being paid £25 an hour. Yes. The agency is getting over £50 an hour. Yes, and, and, and that is... And, and how and, much of that and, is going and that's to you? More expensive to rec- that is more expensive than it is to recruit and to train nurses and staff. And, and, and yet, if yet, the agency wasn't there, what, what, I mean, no one would be doing that shift. So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm being a bit of a devil's advocate. I'm not both sidesing it. I'm just reading, while you speak, a, a, a message from a pal of mine who works in NHS recruitment and points out that we just respond to what our clients ask us for. All we want to do is provide the best quality candidates for our clients, and the margins are often set by NHS England. So a lot of the time we can't be accused of profiteering, um, although he uh, concedes that it does happen sometimes. So I read that with one eye, I listen to you with both ears, and I read with the other eye the story about the NHS paying more than £10 billion annually to agency and bank staff to provide health care in the NHS. And that's where I think Phil is absolutely right. And it is time to get political. The first time I... This is going back a very long time, before I met you, before I'd had this job. As you've probably picked up uh, uh, over the years, I've, I've, I've knocked about, as a consequence of my schooling, I've knocked about with some very wealthy, very, very privileged people o- over the years. And so I've got some very good friends who are beneficiaries of inherited wealth. And I always think that's the key difference, you know, life-changing sums of inherited wealth. Inherited financial security, for me, is the biggest class distinction of them all. If you will inherit financial security, property-owning level financial security, you are in a a, a section of society, even if you currently earn a fraction of what some other people earn, you're you're on a different planet. In a way, assets. Assets is what wealth should be measured by, not not necessarily income, or not exclusively income. And I remember the first time that I went to a dinner party, and they were celebrating the fact, uh, understandably, they were celebrating the fact that one of their friends, I was, I was about 10 years younger than the, the, the rest of the gathering, and I was... I was with yeah, I was with Mrs. O'Brien at the time. We were we were already married, so we we're only going back a maximum of of, of twenty two or three years. And that part of the reason for the dinner was to celebrate the fact that one of their circle had become a a cash millionaire. He had he had over a million pounds in liquid assets. I, I often think I have to say to my wife actually, how much if we got you know, if, if I got kidnapped tomorrow, how much could you actually raise by tea time? He could raise a million pounds by tea time without selling anything. And, and it was, you know, understandable grounds for celebration. And I, and I was fascinated to know what he did. And, and he ran a staff agency, a health agency, health staff agency, whatever the correct turn of phrase is. And it wasn't like a, a road to Damascus moment for me. It wasn't like, oh, my days. But it did just land a little bit differently with me than it landed with everyone else at the table. Because I thought, and you work very hard and you set up the business and you've taken enormous risks 
but you've got a million pounds clear before your 40th birthday because you're taking a commission every time a nurse or a healthcare professional goes into a, a context where they are doing the job that we all paid them to be trained to do. That's a, quite a neat way of knitting together all the calls that we've had so far. And you might think I sound like a communist because you get your definitions of communist from social media or, or weird politicians. But, but, you know, there's a balance to be struck. What if he was celebrating having £100,000 clear in liquid assets? And, of course, the money that he didn't have would have arguably gone into the pockets of staff or stayed in the NHS. I know there's a naivety here, but that, that I think, is a neat way of knit, knitting together a lot of the themes that we've explored so far. It's 10.44. Brian's in Stockport. Brian... Do you know why the assistant manager at Stockport County has been prevented from taking up an exciting new role at Real Madrid? <laughs> uh, well, Stockport County apparently were uh, uh, promoted last season and maybe they want to keep him. It's not that, mate. No, right? Okay, I have no idea. I don't know how often you <laughs> listen to this programme, but if I ask you a completely unexpected question like that, what is likely to be the answer? <laughs> Um, pass. Brexit. <laughs> it's Brexit. So Andy Mangan, assistant coach at Stockport County, set to join the reigning Champions League and Spanish champions in Madrid, but Brexit regulations means that he can't go. He's been denied a work permit. But that's not why you rang in, Brian. What would you like to say? It is not. Thank you. Uh, first of all, my first time caller. Welcome. And it's great. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, to have uh, an independent voice in the media. I hope and so. That I now think, yeah, what's most unusual is that we've found somebody with you that's intelligent and independent. Let's not anyway. get carried away, Brian. Let's not okay. get carried away. Otherwise, I'll start, I'll start asking you about the pubs of Romilly and see how many... Uh... Goodness. Yes, yeah. carry on. No. Thank you. Um, I've not heard anybody say this over the last few years. I've not heard you say, mention it. But it, apparently, in 2005, according to The Guardian, the Tories wrote a pamphlet um, called Direct Democracy. And one of the articles in that pamphlet was about underfunding the NHS and transferring it to the private sector. So this is what they've done, the Tories have done since 2010, has followed that dogma, that ideology. So if we'd lost, we, I'm a Labour member, mm. if we'd lost, we would have uh, an NHS like most, of, or probably every other country, and we know there are many losers in that. Mm. Currently, we need more funding. The Tories will say, oh, we put more and more in. But obviously this report has said, not enough. But I think that's the tactic. Obviously, as Lansley, nobody could understand the report in 2012. The... the um, principles of, of his changes um, and it's been privatisation through the back door which we've seen for 14 years and I, no one can keep all of this in their head can they there's so much that, that, that bubbles over or slips through the net but I've double checked because as soon as you said those words a little echo came back to me that one of the co-authors co of that policy pamphlet was uh, what's his name Hol uh, Hunt that was close. Um, it was yeah, indeed. No, <laughs> <laughs> it was indeed Jeremy Hunt, one of the co-authors of and that. Apparently, uh, that other um, brainstorm, Chris Grayling. Chris Grayling, I think, and I'm very grateful to you for reminding me, Brian, because um, uh, uh, it, it, it no doubt was deliberate. Chris Grayling, we can all celebrate. I think he's elevated to the House of Lords on this very day. I think Chris Grayling oh, becomes oh. Lord Grayling today, which I think is a wonderful testament to the to the health that the justice, prison and probation system finds itself in this very morning. <laughs> Never let it be said that incompetence gets rewarded in the in the world of conservatives. But, um, yeah, you, you make some brilliant points. And thank you for the kind words, Brian. I, I, I mean that. I really do. And, and that is true. That story about the Stockport County assistant coach uh, cannot take up a dream job at Real Madrid because of Brexit regulations. But it is one of the... Uh, frequent moments during our time together where I am beholden to remind you that everybody knew exactly what they were voting for. James O'Brien on LBC. 
It is 10 to 11. Natasha has been at the speech that we are alluding to frequently. Keir Starmer saying there can be no more money for the NHS without reform, but we will find a little more detail from someone who was indeed in the room where it happens shortly. Before that, time for at least one more call about what has happened to the NHS, what it means for staff and patients alike and um and and even perhaps what what reversibility would look like 1051 is the time uh david's in binfield david what would you like to say good morning james Hello, i'm going to take a, a macro view of the nhs which is probably one of the largest organizations in europe certainly i think With it might be the biggest employer actually yeah definitely it probably is yes um with all large organizations even small organizations you have good good people and good parts and and bad parts and i think most of the people in the nhs um are doing a good job i've had very good service yes of course the biggest problem we've got is that the government operates on a five-year time cycle Mm, if that if we're lucky if if we're lucky and Mm. that's (laughs) thank you yes um, and with, with a large organisation like the NHS, you've got to be looking at a 10 to 20, possibly even a 30-year cycle, which is updated like any total quality management programme uh, needs to be uh, updated on a regular basis. Mm. Now, the government's at fault, multiple governments, because they've never taken a long-term view. But... I think they did. I genuinely, I don't. I don't want to sound like a fanboy, but I think they did in '97. I think. I think that well, the NHS reforms brought in in the in the first two Tony Blair terms were designed to last for for years, not not just till the next election. But it didn't really last as long as we would have liked it to do. Well, that's because that's because they me, that's because they lost power me. in 2010, and and patient satisfaction then was at the highest it has ever been. I, I, just just an I'm observation, because I think your broad I'm thrust there. is accurate. And therefore, if they'd have brought in a cross-party yeah. management structure for the NHS, uh, then we would have had a different situation. Does that, do you think, now, I mean, if, if, you've got, if you've got people who believe the NHS should be privatised and people who passionately believe that it shouldn't be, does making them work together on the same team help anybody? General practices yeah. have been privatised yeah. since they started. So we t- talk sense, about yeah. whether the NHS... General practice is self-employed. Uh, they commit. They contracted to the. But you, NHS, were but you were talking about cross-party. You were talking about. I don't, I don't want to badger you, but you were talking about cross-party management. I, I, I mean, I'd buy it if you've got the proof. But the idea of sticking Jeremy Hunt in the same room as Wes Streeting and saying, "All right, lads, sort it out." I just think that's a bit pie in the sky, isn't it, Dave? Well, it it is, and there's an easy way to fix that. Go on. Because if you, if you put two people in a room and you can't agree, yeah, you get rid of those two people and you get another two people in that can agree. I, well, it's certainly simple. That's, that's, that's <laughs> negotiation. Yeah, well, it, it is. It's not really. Well, well, it's not really how negotiations work. But I, I mean, it, 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 they've got to come from the same party, which means that they're both allied to the same manifesto. There's something there. The idea of the NHS being detached at least slightly from party political concerns. But I think the ideological battleground that the earlier caller reminded us of with that 2005 pamphlet by Jeremy Hunt and sundry other Tories, not not to mention the one we used to refer to all the time, which has turned out to be a kind of kiss of death for, for Tory politicians. Um, what was it called? The one that they all wrote, Chris Skidmore and the rest of them all wrote together about how the... I, I'll dig it out. I think Liz Trust. that's actually quite funny. We used to talk about it all the time. We haven't talked about it for ages. Uh, we'll talk about it soon. But first, Natasha Clark, LBC's political editor, has been listening to Keir Starmer's speech. Natasha, over to you. Good morning, James. Yes, um, pretty dire state of play from Lord Darcy, um, Keir Starmer today speaking uh, at the King's Fund's uh, annual conference and speaking uh, about the dire state that he says uh, the Conservatives uh, have left the country in. Let's be really clear about what caused that. That ideologically driven, top-down reorganisation of 2012 from the former Health Secretary Andrew Lansley hopelessly misconceived, cost a fortune, and then all had to be reversed. It's what Lord Darcy describes as a calamity without international precedent, a scorched earth approach to health reform, the effects of which are still being felt today. 
And at the same time, they inflicted what the report describes as the most austere decade since the NH was founded. Crumbling buildings, decrepit porter cabins, mental health patients in Victorian era cells infested with vermin. When we say they broke the NHS, that's not performative politics. Just look at it. So laying the blame squarely uh, at the door of the Conservatives, and that's exactly what this report from Lord Darcy does. It says that Britain was ill-prepared to go into the pandemic because of two reasons. And the first, you heard Keir Starmer talking about it just a few minutes ago, those 2012 reforms that were done by the former Health Secretary, Andrew Lansley, that largely had to be uh, undone. He really put the boot in uh, to that. The second thing is, of course, austerity, years of underfunding, critical infrastructure investment into our NHS into crumbling buildings. Uh, Keir Starmer and Lord Darcy both point the finger at those political choices made in Westminster and say that that is the reason why cancer outcomes haven't improved for so many years, why cardiovascular outcomes are going backwards. Um, but Keir Starmer today obviously just receiving uh, this 120-page report, uh, done a quick rapid review by Lord Darcy since uh, the Labour government got to power to give them a little bit of, of an idea about the state of play. Keir Starmer uh, today promising a 10-year plan for the NHS, giving a little bit of hope, I think, for the future. Um, he said that the NHS was in a critical condition, but crucially, that it wasn't broken. The NHS is at a fork in the road. And we have a choice about how it should meet those demands. Don't act and leave it to die. Raise taxes on working people or reform to secure its future. Our working people can't afford to pay more. So it's reform or die. Reform or die, the message from the Prime Minister uh, today. And you heard him just say just a, a second ago that he's not going to raise taxes in order to put more money into the NHS. And I think one of the crucial messages uh, today from him will be there will be no more money for the NHS unless they accept some of these crucial reforms. Now, we don't exactly know what that's going to look like yet. He talks about digitalising the health service, speeding up some of those outcomes, more scanners. But until we see some of the detail of what this 10-year plan looks like, um, it's going to be pretty hard, I think, for mainly uh, unions to get on board with what could be another set of disastrous reforms. I asked him, actually, how are you going to make sure that those reforms that you put in place uh, learn the lessons from these Andrew Lansley reforms, which are so badly panned? And is it going to take a long time he told me, yes, this is not just a one-term uh, thing. Obviously, Parliament works in five-year terms. Everyone's thinking about the next election. But it's very clear, Keir Starmer today, saying this is going to take a very, very long time to fix. These problems are so deep-rooted in our health service. It could take a decade very for us to see some real change. Isn't it interesting how that uh, uh, Natasha's an analysis there and indeed her, her, her correct representation of, of what Keir Starmer has said about how long it will take plays entirely into the point that was being made by our last caller before we crossed to Natasha about the necessity of having long-term planning. The problem with that, of course, is that you've got to stay in power. Natasha, many thanks indeed, referring, as indeed Lord Darcy and Keir Starmer have, have done, to Andrew Lansley's 2012 reforms, another um, notch on David Cameron's bedpost. Now, we were laughing a moment ago about the idea of Rishi Sunak reward. We look at the state of the probation service the contribution that it's going to make to the dog's dinner of early prisoner releases necessitated, of course, by 14 years of Tory rule. Chris Grayling, widely regarded as having kebabbed the probation service, takes his seat in the House of Lords today. Do, do, here's a question for you. So it's Baron Grayling to you, you pleb, all right? Do you think Andrew Lansley is a baron now or not? So the man, I, I pretty much clearly responsible for much of the mess that the NHS finds itself in today, do you think he got a seat in the House of Lords as well? Perhaps he could sit next to Chris Grayling, widely regarded as responsible for the destruction or the diminishment of the probation service, the man who butchered the NHS. Do you think he gets a seat in the House of Lords as well? It's a simple question, yes or no. I'll tell you after this. James O'Brien on LBC. It is four minutes after 11, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Some, some concern yesterday that we didn't uh, pay enough attention to the Trump-Harris debate. I mean, largely because it, it, it was quite hard to pick the highlights. But we've done a better job today. I've, I've put together some, uh, some clips of Donald Trump talking last night that I think merit repetition. I have a uh, concept of a plan. 
do? Why, in Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in here. They're eating the cats. They're eating the pets. The people that live here. Yeah! Now she wants to do transgender operations on illegal aliens in prison! Oh. I got involved with the Taliban. And then I read that she was black. Either way, it's okay with me. Execution after birth. <laughs> it's like... Four sentences, like run, spot, run. And I told Abdul, don't do it! Our country is going to hell. Thank you. He said all of those things. Uh, but I, I didn't want to inflict it upon you in his, uh, in his actual voice. That was someone I stumbled across on, uh, on, on, the, on the hell site, the social media hell site, who goes by the name of Jaden with a Y, Libran, as in the star sign, Mr. Jaden Libran. Um, uh, uh, reasons to stay on the hell site uh, include not only him, but also uh, yesterday, James Blunt. I, uh, James Blunt on that is just incredible. So he tweeted a while ago about whether or not he should add a Dublin date to his latest tour. And James was a guest recently on Full Disclosure and uh, uh, an absolute, absolute superstar. Really interesting interview, actually. If you listen to it, see if you can tell. He was quite guarded. I think it took me about 10 minutes to sort of um, implicitly persuade him that I was trustworthy and not looking to get some cheap headline out of the interview. And once he'd relaxed, he was such a joy. So, I mean, such a life that he's led. But he tweeted about whether or not he should go to uh, add a Dublin date to his tour. And Ryanair replied to say no. So yesterday, James Blunt announced his, the Dublin leg of his latest tour and swore at Ryanair. That's just how you should use that platform. Um, Unless, of course, you pay for a blue tick and, and prefer to use it to spew bile in sort of all sorts of random directions. Sometimes it appears 24 hours a day. Six minutes after 11 is the time. We will turn our attention next to something, as Monty Python used to say, completely different. And it, it's a headline. If you ever wanted, if you ever find yourself as a sub-editor on a national newspaper and you want to ensure that the story you are writing a headline for ends up on this programme, then... You could do a lot worse. A lot worse. Of course, Andrew Lansley got a peerage. Of, I'm flipping out. That was barely a hook. That was a rhetorical hook and tease. Chris Grayling having kebabbed the probation service goes into the House of Lords today. Andrew Lansley's reward for kebabbing the NHS was a seat in the House of Lords. They're both barons now. Um, if you want to guarantee that a story you are writing the headline for attracts my attention and quite possibly ends up being discussed on the show, then if you put the words... Nobody knows in the headline. You have got a better than even chance of making the cut. I love it. Uh, not least because it reminds me of that geography teacher I used to tell you about all the time. Who, I, It's a little unfair, perhaps, to represent it, but it's true. This is what happened. He, he, he was a PE teacher who wanted to uh, 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 broaden his horizon, so he did, so he did geography. Uh, but he didn't do it much geography. He just did exactly what was needed to teach GCSE geography. I don't know how much interest he had in the subject or how much passion he had for the for the topic. So if you asked him a question, quite regularly he would respond by saying, don't know, nobody knows, don't need to know, which is an odd dynamic for a teacher. And what he meant by don't need to know was it wasn't on the very specific and prescriptive GCSE curriculum. So if you asked him a question that strayed even an inch beyond the parameters of the very specific curriculum, he'd tell you that it didn't matter. It was absolutely irrelevant. So the, the idea of nurturing lifelong interest in the subject was a little bit anathema to him. Don't know, nobody knows, don't need to know. And that has stayed with me. Whenever I see the words nobody knows or no one knows, I find myself thinking, well, I want to know. I want you to tell me. I want you to tell me. Yes, you. I want you to tell me the answer to the question. I know what you're thinking. Well, I can't possibly do that, James, unless you tell me what the question is. And that is a very good point. The question is this. Can social media ban for teens work? No one knows. Is the headline in the Times. Australia is forging ahead with a plan to ban social media for teenagers unless they have parental consent um there's so many variables here that the ability to lie about your age when setting up a social media account ofcom reckon that about a third of eight to 17 year olds have got accounts where they have said they are over 18 you'd be less worried about a 17 year old pretending to be over 18 than you would about an eight-year-old of course um practical privacy and security 
reasons um, uh, are brought to play when you talk about the dangers of letting 13-year-olds upload documents to prove their age. Um, a child's photo, voice or email can be used to estimate their age thanks to AI, but in the UK there's a dis dispute over whether this technology is accurate enough to be deployed. And then, of course, you have the ingenuity of children and the fact that most of them probably know a little bit more about the tech than their parents do. Is that still true? Is that still true? Because the trope I reach for at this point is programming the VHS video recorder, which I think is an indication more of my age than of anything else. If you're anywhere close to my age, well, actually, if I may just take a little moment, if you are anywhere close to my age, and as a consequence of that, this is the week or indeed even the day that you are waving your oldest child away to university, then I join you. I join you in the dewy-eyed reminiscences and the absolute incredulity at how fast time passes. You are in my thoughts, just as I hope I'm in yours. If you've been listening to this program since I became a father, which was announced live on air by a minicab driver who had picked me up at the hospital. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Um, it, she, she's gone off to university today. And I'm, I'm broken. How did that happen? How does that happen? How does the time... Take your time if yours are little, if they're younger. I know everyone tells you this. But honestly, it's over before you know it. Blink of an eye stuff. Take When you go home tonight, just, just carve out 20 minutes, half an hour, just to play. Just to play. Just to do silly stuff together. Whatever it is they want to do. If they're a little bit older, it's harder. But find something they want to do and just do it with them. Listen to some Taylor Swift records. Whatever it is that they want to do. Even if you find it but Just do it for me. To, not for me. Do it for you and for them tonight. Because I tell you what, you'll go to sleep one night and you'll wake up the next morning and they're leaving. To go away. Either to start their job, to, to, to flee the nest, or in my case, they're off to university. So go on, just do that tonight. You'll th thank me later, all right? Do something they want to do this evening and just do it with them, with no distractions. Leave your phone in the kitchen. No distractions at all. Or, of course, if you're cooking together, leave your phone in the lounge. Just do something tonight because it will be over. And right now, you don't believe it will ever be over, but it will be. That's the end of my TED Talk. 11.11 11 is the time. The idea of social media being somehow removable from a teenager's life. So the reason I mentioned the VHS video recorder is I belong to a generation that understood the tech a lot more than their parents did. So we were very excited when we got our VHS video recorder from Radio Rentals, quite possibly delivered by Kim Casey, the kid of Mr. Harris football player, who still holds the all-time record for the most goals scored for a single team in a single season. But such was the nature, the semi-professional nature of kid, kid of Mr. Harriers at the time, that Kim Casey uh, also worked for Radio Rentals in Kidderminster, or certainly one of the um, uh, companies that used to rent out TVs and videos, because most of us rented them in those days. You wouldn't believe it, would you? I sound a bit like Donald Trump now. But don't worry, I'm weaving. I'm weaving lots of different things together. And Dad had no idea. Absolutely no idea how to program the video, whereas my sister and I worked it out quite quickly. So if he ever wanted anything recording on timer, as opposed to just pressing the buttons and recording it, he would ask us to do it. So I've got this idea that children are more au fait with the tech than I am. I watch my kids on social, and, and that, I, I don't have, I don't really do TikTok. Um, I've got people to do that for me. And I, I watch them on TikTok and Insta, and they, they do stuff. I mean, they, they zip around and they do stuff. And, they're, and so I, I get all of that. But in terms of the, the actual business of signing up, logging on, proving your ID, I wonder whether a parent in their 30s or 40s now really does feel uh, left behind. By, I, don't, I, I suspect that's another thing that's changed. I suspect I'm looking at it through my... 35 year old eyes instead of your 35 year old eyes and you think that you can actually control your child's social media use um it could be a stricter age verification i always think of the gambling sites the gambling sites don't seem to have any trouble imposing really strict rules on who can and can't sign up who can and can't get involved so why should it be any harder for social media companies to do the same um, I don't know whether the business model gets destroyed when all the Russian bots and, 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 and weirdos are prevented from signing on, but uh, I, don't, I don't know is the short answer. And there are two ways into this, okay? 14 minutes after 11 is the time.
there are two ways into this. There are the people who know a lot about the technology. 0345 973 The people who know a lot about the technology. Australia is going to ban social media for teenagers unless they have parental consent. Can that work? Right? So that demands a degree of qualification, knowledge, and understanding. Uh, maybe things haven't changed so much. James just texted to say, my seven-year-old showed me how to use my Sky Q remote more efficiently, James. Completely blew my mind, as I thought I'd have a few more years before my kids taught me that type of thing. And you do. I said, my godson came around the other day and showed me how to just watch YouTube videos on my normal telly rather than on my laptop. And I'm, I'm not stupid. I know it would have been quite easy to work out. But to them, it's second nature. It's second nature. So question number one is, how technologically feasible is it? Question number two is something that we dance around a lot, isn't it? And, and it's almost how, how, behavior, how behaviorally. God, I wish there was a better word to describe that. Behaviorally. I'll try again. How behaviorally feasible is it to stop to... I mean, how baked into our lives do you think social media is? I'm pretty close if I had half a million followers instead of 1.2 million, I would be thinking very seriously about stepping away from one platform now because Elon Musk has toxified it in such a ridiculous way that it's, it's almost impossible now to wade through all the manure before you actually get to the people who you would like to hear from. It's such a weird thing to do, isn't it? Like the, it's a bit like a, a, a kind of sex pest on public transport for women, isn't it? A person who just refuses to accept that you have no interest whatsoever in, in, what they, in what they want to say or in what they want to do. You just, please, just leave me alone. But they dedicate their lives to badgering and pestering and harassing people who do not want to hear from them ever. It's so bizarre. It's kind of what Elon, Elon Musk is the embodiment of that. I don't know if you saw the message that he sent to Taylor Swift the other day. It was disgusting uh, by any objective measure. But there are people, the world is full of people. Until Donald Trump became president, I don't know that the rest of us realise how many of them that there are. People who think that, you know, creepy men have absolutely got the right to sit next to women on empty trains and harass them or ask them why they're not smiling or a, a fraction of the unpleasantness and inconvenience but on social media the the, the 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 algorithm or whatever it's called since elon musk took over has very much championed the cause of weirdos who want to be noticed by people that they profess not to like it's such a strange way to behave but it is so baked into our existence there's not much point getting in touch to tell me well it's not baked into mine because i think that's a bit like saying bread isn't popular because you don't eat it. I could be wrong if you think you have, uh, but, but if I say it's baked into our existence and you say, well, it's not baked into mine, I think that's a bit like me saying bread is very popular. Bread is a very popular food stuff. And I'll get half a dozen texts saying, well, actually, I don't eat bread. It doesn't really change the fact in any way that bread is a very popular food stuff, does it? Bread is a very popular food stuff. Oh, look, here's Martin in Milton Keynes. I don't eat bread, James. No, I, I made up that name. If you are Martin in Milton Keynes, don't take it personally. But it is so baked into our life, right? It's so baked in. It's so baked into our lives that I just don't know behaviorally how feasible it is to tell teenagers they can't use it. If, and here's the final question, actually. Here's the third question. Would you give parental permission to your teenager if it became necessary? So there's three ways into this. The technological, the behavioral, and the consensual. Oh, that was good. It's almost like I planned this stuff. The technological plausibility of banning teenagers from social media because Australia is about to try. Anthony Albanese, the Australian Prime Minister, is about to become, I think, the first Prime Minister in the world to ban teenagers from using social media. Is he having a giraffe? 0345 6060 973. Question number two. Is it an impossible task, regardless of the technology, because it is so baked into the existences of all of us, but in this case, especially teenagers, 0345 973 And finally, would you give permission? I, I, that's a really hard question to, because I, I mean, 
my girls like it and they touch wood haven't ended up going down any unhealthy rabbit holes or anything like that but they've got we, i know two or three teenagers who have could you really i mean i used to have to go to bed quite early before i went away to boarding school and i used to have to go to bed when i could still hear some of my mates playing football out uh, 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 oh no we didn't play football in the street we only played football in each other's gardens but i could hear them riding their bikes up and down the pavement and i was in bed and i i'm not sure i've ever forgiven my parents for that my friend Adam was allowed to watch The Incredible Hulk, which didn't come on until I'd been in bed for an hour and a half. And he was younger than me. So would you actually deny your parents? Do you think I should let that go now? Is that... No? Well, I'm not going to, if you're listening, Mum. That was outrageous behaviour. Would you deny your children access to it? 03456060973 is the number you need. It's 20 past 11. James O'Brien on LBC. 22 minutes after 11. Australia is trying to ban social media for teenagers. Will it work? Nobody knows. What do you think? 03456060973. I, George, is this idiot's corner territory, mate? I don't know, unless I've misunderstood your point. If you can ban smoking outdoors, I'm pretty sure you can ban social media for kids. I don't, I, I don't know, either I've misunderstood your answer or you've completely misunderstood the question. If you can ban smoking outside pubs, the comparison you make is with banning smoking inside pubs and asking yourself how easy it would be to ban smoking on territory. The difference between A and B is that is a roof, right? How does that translate into the incredibly technologically complicated question of whether or not you can ban teenagers from using social media. I apologise if I've misunderstood you, and if I haven't, it's Idiot's Corner. Hey, we got a sound effect. Did you get the sound effect? Did anyone give you the sound effect? We got a sound effect. Has, that, has it happened? The sound effect. I can't hear anything. 23 after 11. Uh, Elaine's in Richmond upon Thames. To steer us back, can social media ban for teens work? No one knows. Do you know, Elaine? Uh -huh. I wish I did. Right. I wish I did. Uh, can I just say that I think we've got before because you called me the Barato Elaine watch because I came on and sang. Mm. So that's who I am, if that rings a bell with oh, you. Yes, I don't remember that. You're, you're a professional, aren't you? <laughs> I am, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm actually involved, and I've actually done something with Natasha Terran. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, this is going to sound awful. I'm going to have to get a better phone line. It's not because you mentioned Natasha, of whom I'm an enormous fan. It's, it's, it's going to sound like it's a ban. God, you mentioned another presenter. I hate it when that happens. So we'll get you back up when the phone line works. Paul's in dark. Well, kind of find myself thinking we can't even get a good phone line into the studio. How on earth are we ever going to ban people from using social media? But that's probably not a valid comparison. Uh, Paul's in Dartford. Paul, what would you like to say? Hi. Yeah, um, I think... Um, well, I've got a 14 stroke fifth, coming up 15 year old girl and it's the only thing we argue about really is indoors it? is yeah. is getting off your phone there it's an addiction I think now with these kids and your your question about you know would you yeah. would you ban them would you give the consent I think I'll be quite you know there's a there's an element now as a, as a parent you're kind of scared to you know because if you it's just that argument it's that you just want that bit of peace. We, you know, they, she doesn't have her phone in her bedroom when she goes to bed. Oh, that's or a, that's, in, a pro, that's Then you're, all, you're way ahead of a lot of people, mate. <laughs> exactly. Fair. But it's, it's a constant it's a constant thing every day. Not, you know, not big arguments, but it's just it's that thing. How much do you use yours? I'm not on any social media. Are you not? Nope, none uh, of it. Well, that, that, puts you, that puts you in, in, in a tricky, situ tricky situation in a way because I, I'm, I, I'm getting better, but at one point I was on it all the time. I loved it as well. I mean, it, I didn't feel yeah. like it was unhealthy or that I was addicted or anything like that. I just really, really liked the flow of information, the, 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 the multiplicity of opinion, the jokes, the memes, the comedy. So mine could turn around to me and say, yeah, all right, all right, granddad, what about you? You know, you, you, you like things like pulling it out of the table. They caught me once telling them no no phones at the table five minutes later without even yeah. noticing i pulled mine out so that's not yeah. you no ah, no no so you know my son's 18 we kind of at this stage where we can't you know we can't tell him what to do no you know he's an adult but we had that he's gone through it have you tried um, that it's my house my rules i've tried that and that doesn't always yeah, that. no 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 i oh, know yeah. Oh, yeah so it, uh, yeah i think it's i would prefer the government to say 
kids can't do it, and then it's take it out of our hands. You say, well, I can't. Well, it's not though, is it? Because her friends all get permission, and then she says, well, can I, Dad? Can I have permission? No, but that's what I mean. It's not a parental per- permission thing. It's a flat ban for everyone. Like you said about, like you said about gambling. I don't yeah. know how that is. You know, eighteen. My son got a gambling yeah. um, app. He doesn't gamble a lot, but he sure. got it. So there yeah. must be something that stopped him. Until he was eighteen, yeah, like yeah, you said, there is. They so. can do, they can do it. So you'd do that. You'd ban them all from social media until they're eighteen. Well, but I think sixteen's a good a good. It's, it's, I don't know. I don't know what one it is, but TikTok seems to be just. They can't take their, their eyes off. That's they can't designer. Put the you know, a pal of mine, right? Who, I mean, he's he's he's, he's my age, but he was a lot more plugged into all this stuff. He worked in the sector. He he went on TikTok once and he, he got absolutely terrified. He said, I've never known anything like it. He said, I, I went on, I looked at two or three things. It just knew me. Yeah. Off, after an hour, it knew me better than anyone else. <laughs> and that, that is why people c- can't get off it again. And, it, and, and of course, yeah. sometimes it gets a little unhealthy or it pushes them down unhealthy paths. But the, but the programming, <laughs> the, the algorithmic programming is literally designed to maximize the amount of time you spend staring at it. And that that's yeah. evil. And there's part of it you said about, I, I think I'm quite tech savvy, but there's things yeah. they, they have to do, these streaks. I have no idea what that is, but it seems to be something they've got to do. Keeping. If they don't, if they don't keep their streaks going. Oh, oh that's not on TikTok, is it? That's on other online it things. It might be like, on Instagram. You I even get it on Duolingo, to be honest with you. In fact, I do Wordle <laughs> and I keep missing a day yeah. and, and I get, I get really cross. <laughs> I, I haven't even got, I haven't hit double figures for about six months, which is pathetic really. Cause I finished work at one. Or t- anyway, we're digressing a bit. Neither of us know how feasible it is, but we're pointing at the gambling companies and thinking if they can do it, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And nice one, Paul. Good luck with it. And, I, and I'll just remind you what I said about, I know you've got an 18 year old, but, but mine is leaving home today. So, um, try not to argue about it with her tonight. Try and do something together that you both enjoy. Uh, uh, if there is, I mean, crikey, it's coming up to 1129. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. How feasible is it? I, I genuinely don't know. Australia is forging ahead with a plan to ban social media for teenagers unless they have parental consent. And the world is asking, can it work what is your answer to that question you today get to tell the world no less can it work um i've got uh, speaking of online dangers there's an extraordinary moment in the post debate analysis that i want to share with you after this in fact it involves one of trump's key advisors a, a, a very uh sinister character called stephen miller and a Venezuelan journalist does something that I've been waiting for someone to do for quite a long time. I've told you how worried I am by the proliferation on social media of accounts dedicated to footage of crimes committed by people of color. They are designed to ferment racism, to spread racism, and to perpetrate the myth that people of color are somehow innately criminal and that white people don't commit crimes. It, it's, it, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. It's, it's absurd that anyone could fall for it, but people do. I think in large part the Farage riots were caused by that kind of online content, including, of course, the, the man himself using an alleged people trafficker as his major news source. But the, the damage done to people by this constant bombardment of cctv criminality or footage from 10 years ago or 5,000 miles away and the suggestion that it's happening on your doorstep or that it's about to happen on your doorstep it reached a, a, a kind of culmination in a way with the uh, comments from donald trump about eating dogs um but it reached another culmination afterwards when stephen miller was speaking to a venezuelan journalist and the venezuelan journalist did the thing he did the thing where you demand evidence you demand evidence. Still, journalists left, right, and centre. I, I think I think the journalist is Chilean, actually, but his in-laws are Venezuelan. Demand evidence from these people. Get them to explain themselves. And what happened when somebody finally did that to Stephen Miller is absolutely extraordinary. And I, and, and I'm going to share it with you after the headlines with Thomas Watts. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.34 is the time. So Stephen Miller is very much at the, the, the vanguard of the kind of Donald Trump movement and the abandonment of evidence and truth in pursuit of rhetoric, hate and feelings, prioritising feelings over facts. 
Um, the uh, Washington DC correspondent Jose Maria del Pino has he, he's Chilean, but he has Venezuelan uh, uh, family members, so he knows of what he talks and. Maduro is the dictator in Venezuela. And one thing you can say about dictators as a general rule is that they're not the most reliable or trustworthy people on the planet. And when all of these uh, um, threads come together in the same place, something truly extraordinary happens. So if, if you are in the business of advising a former president and potentially a future president, or in your view, hopefully a future president, you used to have basic requirements of responsibility. You used to have to at least abide by universal rules even if you were passionately opposed to the opposite team there was a general agreement on what the rules of engagement were what the rules of the match involved that disappeared when Kellyanne Conway used the phrase alternative facts to describe lies still a mystery how many people are comfortable with that but Donald Trump in many ways is the mothership of pretending that lies and truths have equal and opposite force and if you question these people correctly, they either crumble or explode. And I'm not going to tell you whether Stephen Miller, who has a particularly interesting record, whether he crumbled or exploded when he was confronted with a relatively straightforward but still pitifully rare style of journalism. All these criminal migrants that have been flooded in the country are going to be the first to get thrown out of here. I mean, you, you've seen case after case, these heartbreaking tragedies. Those ones are going to get found and deported first. And look at this, this Venezuelan gang. You have a Venezuelan gang that is taking over entire apartment buildings in Aurora, Colorado. And that's responsible, by the way, for some of the most heinous crimes that have happened all over the United States. The crime rate in Venezuela is down, I believe, a little bit over 60%. Over the last several years. Are you trusting the official figures from the Venezuelan dictatorship? Let's put it this way. If you're a dictator of a poor country with a high crime rate, wouldn't you send your criminals to our open that, border? That wasn't my question. Are but you but trusting but the figures of the dictatorships? Maduro Those are Maduro, Maduro numbers. I am believing that it is in the interest of a criminal dictator to let his criminals out of their jails and come to our do country. Do you have numbers, real numbers, not the numbers. numbers. The, 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 the Venezuelan gangs, that have, you, you've seen the CCTV footage. I have a question, who do you think? Answer me this. My family is from Venezuela. Yes. I know very well the situation of Caracas and many other cities. Right, tell me, who were the people with the high-powered rifles in the hallway of that apartment building? Who were they? They were gangsters from Venezuela. Right. No American community. But I was asking to you about figures, numbers, what I'm facts. To you is the facts are the dead bodies. The facts are. You said that Caracas has a lowest crime the rate than the are, USA. The facts are the mutilated bodies. The facts are the people in the morgues that are dead. I was asking you about Caracas and the numbers in Caracas. Are you trusting the numbers of the dictatorship? To, I am to trusting state the fact that Kamala Harris is letting you illegal yelling? immigrants into this country who are raping and murdering children. I, I had been very do respectful. You know, Why are you, you yelling? Know, do you know who Jocelyn Hungary is? Do you know who she is? Do you know how Tell many who people is. Who is, is experiencing who is violence she? in Caracas? Who is she? Who is Lake and Riley? Who is yelling she? again? Because I'm yelling because children are being raped and murdered. I was just asking for figures, immigrants. and you have not children replied to me about those figures. And murdered. Do you know who Kayla Hamilton is? Do you trust is? the numbers of Nicolas Maduro? I'm asking again. I trust a ruthless dictator will empty his prisons and send their criminals to our country. So you trust his numbers? The most, da the most dangerous gang in Venezuela. Do you now trust Nicolas Maduro? I trust that he does not want his criminals to be. So you believe in his numbers? I believe he's sending his criminals to our country. Do, do you, you think not, that the crime rate in Venezuela not, have decreased? Do you not believe the law enforcement reports of Venezuelan gangs in this country? I was asking for are the Venezuelan, Venezuelan gangs, government figures, Venezuelan not the figures here. Or not? Are Venezuelan gangs in this country or not? Yes or no? What yes or are no? the figures yes no? that you yes say no? to say yes that no? in, in Caracas yes the no? number is lower than in the gangs, USA? Are Venezuelan gangs in this country or not? So you don't have numbers? Are Venezuela? You know who has numbers? The Department of Homeland Security. You can ask Mayorkas for numbers. You can ask the Director Ray for the numbers. Sir, I'm telling you. You said you think that in Venezuela the crime rate is lower than because, the USA. Yes, because what the are your are numbers? Here That's now. my question. Because the criminals are here now. Those are Maduro's numbers. I can tell you again that Border Patrol agents are encountering Do thousands of you trust of Maduro numbers? numbers? I trust the border agents in our country. But and I am not saying that Caracas has a lower crime rate. 
children are dead and you are wasting my time. No, I am not children wasting your time. I'm asking for facts as a journalist. Do you have any remorse for the dead children? Do you care at all about the dead children? Absolutely. Then that's what I want to leave you with, is that Donald Trump I will come was just asking office. for figures. Here's what's going to happen. Donald Trump is going to be elected president and the migrant gangs are going to be sent home. Children's lives will be saved. And you know who will benefit the most? are the working class Hispanic communities that are besieged by gang violence. So you have, have public years. schools that are being overtaken by migrant gangs. You have MS-13 that is brutalizing children. You have Kayla Hamilton, who was a 20-year-old autistic girl who was raped and murdered, beaten to death. That will end, that will stop, and our children's lives will be saved. That is the most virtuous thing that can possibly be done. We are going to save the lives of our children. We will not let Kamala Harris condemn them to a life of misery, suffering, and death. Thank you. I have you. not replied my question. You have not replied my question. Oh, man. I, ju I just so rare. I don't know why. Uh, so many people fail just to stick with the question, stick with the simple question. Provide me with the evidence for your claim. Are you really believing the figures of a dictator? And I'd, I'd remind you that the very emotive uh, appeal to rape is coming from a man who is currently on the team of a man who is an adjudicated rapist in, in, in the case of Donald Trump and routinely boasts about sexually assaulting women or, or claims that somehow their looks determine whether or not they would be worth raping. So I, I just I just find that so uplifting occasionally to find to stumble across a journalist who just understands the importance of not letting them move on from a question a hell of a lot of people in this country could learn from that uh, they really could um, not least uh, when questioning the public figures responsible for spreading the lies and the bile and that of course the, the the racist rhetoric that contributed to the farage riots not so long ago just go in on how anybody could possibly trust an alleged people trafficker uh, and, and sex offender when looking for, based in Romania, when looking for trustworthy information about what's happening in the United Kingdom. And don't let it go. Just keep asking again and again and again and again until either you say that was a terrible mistake and I'm incredibly sorry or, uh, or, or you explode like Stephen Miller just did. Incredible journalism. Uh, thank you, I should say, to... Uh, Jose Maria del Pino. Uh, 11.41 is the time. Stephen's in Exeter. I bet you can't remember why you rang him. But we're looking at the feasibility of banning teenagers from using social media, Stephen. Otherwise, they, they could end up uh, like Stephen Miller. What would you like to say? I, uh, yeah, I, um, I, th I, think, I think, you know, obviously from a technology standpoint, it's entirely plausible. Is it? How do you um, know? You know just as <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a IT manager at IFM, we, we, we use lots of ID systems and that, you know, to ensure over 18s only. And just as you said, and it's been mentioned, betting companies. And it's the same with, you know, you sign up for a fintech bank now, you take a silly video of yourself saying a line and a picture of your ID yes. um, for verification. But, you know, I, I think the two biggest things... God, you're right. It does uh, voice recognition, yeah, doesn't it, yeah, as well? When you're yeah. on the phone, you don't need your security questions anymore. Sorry. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the two biggest things will be one cooperation from the social media companies to implement that. Um, that that's going to be a biggie, you know, because because it's not something they could sit in between. They need cooperation Does from... It'd be a legal requirement, person. though. You, otherwise, we'd Brazil your ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not a technical but, term there. I do apologise. No. So, so, so I think that's one factor, and, and the second factor will be you know systems for circumvention. You know, people will always find a way around something, and there are definitely ways around um, uh, you know age restrictions on, on uh, access to online material, um, whether or not that's you know using your brother and sisters details or them setting it up for you yeah, or pretending point. you're in another country like buying know? alcohol exactly. get your 18 year old brother to do it for you or your 18 year old exactly. sister to do it for you yeah so I, I think they're probably the two biggest things yeah but how big are they that's the point Stephen. so i, I listen you, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good nothing's ever 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 going to be foolproof i'm sure there are 15 no. year olds who are managing to find a way to gamble online but the the, yeah. but the massive majority yeah. Of, of of effort has paid off. So would yeah. the uh, would the would the loopholes you describe be enough to to hold the entire project below the waterline? Yeah, I think I think you know I I, I mentioned to your colleague I think it would work for the large majority. I, yeah. Obviously, there'd, there'd be a minority that you know would circumvent the things, just like you said. Yes, yeah, so there always will everything. be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do think it'd work. And yeah. would it be a good thing? 
Um, it may be. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I you know. I think that's a question to be had, isn't it? You know. I, I I'm. I think from some aspects it would be a good thing. You know, there's lots of content on there now on different platforms that that I believe you know from a personal span standpoint I think is dangerous. Um, for, for younger generations yeah, and, and younger too. people, and it, it kind of crept up on um, us. It was it was it was yeah. almost as if it was it was gone too far by the time we realised how dangerous it was to claw it back again. But what they're doing in Australia is at least attempt, and the phrase I used at the time and the phrase I'd use now is uh, attempt to get the genie back in the bottle, which is a figure of speech, of course, for something that's impossible to do. But that is what they're trying to do, and uh, I for one wish them well. Stephen, thank you. It's coming up to quarter to twelve. After this, um. Another story that I, I, I find absolutely fascinating, and it's, it's yet more evidence of Russian interference in democratic or Western public discourse. And, and arguably the deepest dive yet has been undertaken by a journalist called David Gilbert for Wired, um, which is a splendid publication. Um, uh, and, uh, well, he's going to join us after this to talk us through what he has discovered, it links to those Department of Justice revelations recently about the Russian propaganda project, uh, including and deploying prominent, I would describe as far right figures on social media, as it stays with the social media theme, to punt Kremlin friendly propaganda for immense sums of money, albeit that the, many of the people involved insist they had absolutely no idea the money was coming from the Kremlin. Uh, we're going to find out a lot more about that after this. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.49, it's Thursday, so silliness on the horizon, but before that some rather more seriousness. Uh, an awful lot of um, admiration coming in for the Chilean journalist who exposed Stephen Miller, Trump's advisor, to uh, what, what, what remains pitifully rare questioning. Quite a few of you have deployed my friend and colleague Emily Maitlis's name as a verb saying that Miller got mate list and she is indeed one of the people who understands the importance of not letting any uh, interviewees but particularly politicians with a long and proud track record of lying uh, to, to move along gilly gashing what's the word that they gilly galloping or something there's a there's a great phrase that made it my friend Mehdi Hassan uses a lot to describe what politicians do when they try and uh, and just gloss over their little throwaway lies and nonsenses but I suppose I, I, we, we should remind ourselves briefly of just how high up the chain of political command those kind of inflammatory racist lies can travel. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. And this is what's happening in our country, and it's a shame. It's funny, isn't it? it you, you, there was a great report on NBC in America last night on how this lie has impacted upon the lives of, of uh, people of Haitian origin living in that town. Uh, you can imagine. And, and you don't have to be, I don't think, uh, the kid in, in the sixth sense to, to knit these patterns together. And say, That's how riots happen. That's how people end up trying to set fire to hotels full of asylum seekers, by spreading lies. So in whose interest is it, apart from politicians like Donald Trump, and I suppose uh, to an extent Nigel Farage as well, who, in whose interest is it for the, this racist rhetoric, these divisive lies to go nuclear, to go viral? Absolutely brilliant piece of journalism on Wired.com um, last week by a journalist called David Gilbert. It appears under the headline DOJ, as in Department of Justice. As in, this is what they're saying. Russia aimed propaganda at gamers' minorities to swing 2024 election. And I'm delighted to say that David Gilbert joins me now. Um, where should we begin? Should we begin with you explaining to us who Ilya Gambashidze is and what he does? Yeah, sure. Good to be here, James. Um, I suppose we can actually begin with what Trump just said, mm. the, the dogs thing, because like that very well could have come from a Russian bot online and it has percolated through and has been repeated by a former president in front of 60 million people or however many people watched the debate the other night, because that's how this stuff works. Um, and yeah, so Ilya Gambacidi is the person who the Justice Department in the US has said is behind what is one part of Russia's efforts to disrupt the US election in 2024. He, his company, the Social Design Agency, um, came up with a plan called the Good Old USA Project. And 
in an indictment that was unsealed last week, they published this document in full and it's five or six pages long and it gives an unprecedented insight into exactly how sophisticated, how organized a Russian disinformation can be. And it also gives a fascinating insight into how exactly they think that they can successfully disrupt the election by not by kind of claiming that Russia is good or Trump is great, but by poking holes in the kind of divisions that are already there in the US going in on culture wars, going in on race, going in on stuff that they know people will get angry about. So that kind of the Haitian thing is the exact type of thing that people in Russia are now looking at going, right, let's get on top of this. Let's make this worse than it is already. Why do they want to do that? Um, because this, the, the stated goal in this thing, and it, you know, Trump has always said that, you know, the, the Russians don't, aren't, behind him and they don't want to uh, give him, you know, put him into the White House. And a lot of experts are kind of also saying that they want to just create chaos. Mm. But in this document, it clearly states in black and white that the goal of this campaign is to get Donald Trump back into the White House because they want the US to stop sending support to Ukraine. That's their ultimate goal. And that's why they want to do it. Which suggests that this doesn't end with Gampaj. Uh, Gambashidze, doesn't it? It suggests that the, that the orders are coming from, and indeed there is some suggestion, if not evidence, that the orders are coming from much higher up the chain than that. Yeah, the, like the the FBI agent who wrote up the indictment got, like, he doesn't explain how he got him, but he got notes from meetings between this guy who runs the social design agency and, um, you know, high-ranking Russian officials. And in those meeting notes, it clearly says that Vladimir Putin has been appraised of this project, approves of it, and is being kept updated about its goals and its success, effectively. So how, how does it work, David? I, I'm online, I, and let's say that I am in one of the uh, constituencies that have been identified as having been targeted, which is certain, certain minorities, swing state residents, online gamers. A lot of this tracks back to online gaming, doesn't it? A lot of this um, practice. But mm. what, what, what then happens to me, as it were? So, yeah, so you're an online gamer in uh, Wisconsin and you're scrolling through X or Redis or one of the platforms that you regularly go on and you come across potentially a meme or a video that you think is funny um, and there's a link with it and you click on a link and you go to a website that appears as if it's a legitimate news source. So it could look like in the past, they've used the Washington Post or Fox News, and they've created a website that looks, for all intents and purposes, as if it's the real thing. But the article that you're reading is, you know, some version of a pro-Russian or anti-Ukrainian missive talking about how um, uh, neo-Nazis are running Ukraine and some, some disinformation that Russia wants you to believe. And it you you're not going to check the url you're not going to check you know is this the real washington post website because you don't have time to do that so you see that and it just goes in oh. and then these bots online are are reinforcing all this as well and and volume then becomes the key factor does it the bombardment of oh. it that it that, that any any skepticism or curiosity that might kick in can be assuaged by the sheer weight of evidence that it's true up to and including to knit it together to something else that was in the uh, documents released by the doj last week up to and including people who are quite famous in the online space in, in in the world of commentary and and punditry yeah so there's there's different factors but obviously that's one part the other part is they're using ai to do this so they can do it now at scale that they've never been able to do it before and the AI is getting so good that it's even difficult for people to realize that they're, you know, AI bots. And the other aspect is using influencers to give it a kind of a sheen of credibility. Um, there, we saw in a, in a parallel investigation that was also unsealed last week that these influencers like Tim Poole and Dave Rubin um, and Lauren Southern were exposed as working for a media company that is being paid by RT, the Russian state media company. What was most fascinating to me about the, the indictment was it says that the FBI has seen a list of 2,800 influencers in 81 countries around the world who this company that Ilya is keeping an eye on for 
they, because they think that they are willing to push pro-Russian signals. 600 of those are in the US. They include journalists, bloggers, vloggers like we saw exposed mm. last week, but also include members of Congress. The FBI hasn't published that list yet. So we don't know who's on it, but they do. We could take and a they, fairly good guess, couldn't we? If we were so well, minded. It's funny when I, when I posted a tweet that people were very quickly uh, willing to offer up suggestions of who could potentially yeah. be enthralled to, to the Kremlin here. And, and the thing is, we may not even, you know, I suppose Tim Poole and those guys say that they were unwitting victims they do, yes. in this. They claim they're the vi victims. They weren't aware that they were being played by the Kremlin. You can believe that if you want, or you can, you know, not believe it. But in a lot of cases, there we know that there are a lot of people who are willing to take money and not really question where it's coming from. And that suggests that Russia has a huge network of these people operating in the US, but also in other countries, such as the UK, such as Ireland, such as anywhere else. And, and a, a crucial distinction here, so they, they could be operating in the UK or Ireland or, or any one of these 81 countries, but still actually dedicating most of their online activity to trying to disrupt discourse or spread propaganda in America or on the American market. But I, I think, is, is, it, is it fair to say that the chance, it's highly likely that this would also involve Russian money sponsoring propaganda dissemination about British politics. So, so some of the oh, figures uh, that seem to be uh, uh, curiously of a piece with Vladimir Putin's worldview and who have a public profile in this country may also be receiving money without asking too many questions about where it's coming from. Absolutely. This, this campaign, this good old USA project is one very specific campaign within a broader network that is called Doppelganger. And that Doppelganger kind of network has been used to attack Germany, it has been used to attack France, it has been used to attack the UK specifically. And we saw it with the um, US riots, or sorry, the UK, UK riots riot, recently, yeah. where the, the Russian bot accounts that, you know, researchers are tracking, they know who these guys are, they've reported them multiple times to the social media companies, social media companies don't care. So they're able to track and I speak to researchers in Russia who are tracking these guys every single day and they send me a message in the morning and say about three o'clock this evening we will see a campaign launch where they will attack this very specific subject i log on at three o'clock and there it is it's so well organized and so well timed that they can now predict when these campaigns are going to begin it's and it's just happening out in the open but no one seems to be paying any real attention well, thank, except maybe the doj now and, and well thank god you are as well um so would it be fair to say that when uh, riots started unfolding on british streets people started trying to set fire to hotels full of asylum seekers then um regardless of who uh, provoked or prompted that violence back in moscow there would have been champagne courts popping and high fives being exchanged uh absolutely but also there would have been another team going okay how do we make this even worse? How do we look at what's, you know, because we saw with those UK rights, we saw um, lawmakers in making the situation worse. And they're like in the, in the good old USA project, one of the teams involved, all they do is monitor Republican lawmakers output every single day. They just, they just read their tweets, read what they're posting on social media and collate that and pass it on to the next team and they then craft messages around what republican lawmakers are saying in order to wow so it's a symbiotic what they already it's, know yeah they already know that these messages are what are really hitting with the 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 followers that they want to target the, the online so world. they're just using the own word their own words so that would have happened in the uk as well so if i was seeking to make the situation worse in the aftermath of the riots i for example might start spreading the idea that the police come down harder upon the actual people who were rioting than they do upon for example ethnic minorities or other sections of society that would be i imagine a very good example of what the kremlin would want to happen that would be ideal can't think of anyone who's done that 
David, mm. off the top Tough, of my head. Isn't it? Yeah. it is. Um, can we keep mm. in touch? This is absolutely fascinating. And as absolutely, you say, not yeah. something this, that gets... This isn't going anywhere. Anywhere near enough light or oxygen. We will do our small part to improve that situation, but we can't without the help of people like David Gilbert, who's um, a journalist for Wired.com covering disinformation and online extremism. I don't know why I can't think of anyone that's just that dived headfirst into the idea of two-tier policing and bought wholesale into the idea of watching the riots possibly even having helped cause them and then thought mm, what can i do to make the situation even worse answers on a postcard please james o'brien on lbc go on go on oh there it is i did i forgot to mention it was mystery i haven't mentioned mystery hour for about half an hour but the, but, but the phone lines are full nonetheless there it goes the final phone line just filled up at the end there shortly after i said go on go on which is not language that necessarily comes naturally to me welcome welcome all this is your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily achievable anywhere else on your radio dial you almost certainly have a by the way the question i was asking in the at the end of the last hour about who on earth could possibly be seeking to actually make the situation of the riots worse by spreading lies about two-tier policing that was not an inclusion an early entry for Mystery Hour. It was a, a largely rhetorical question to which I'm delighted to see almost all of you already know the answer. What's that you say? Even in the House of Commons? Surely not. But there are genuine mysteries out there which are much harder to solve than that one, and that is what we concern ourselves with now. You know the number. Um, if you have a question that needs answering, a riddle that needs unravelling, or even perhaps an enigma that needs solving, then the number that you need is 0345 If you hear somebody else ask a question to which you know the answer, then be still your beating heart. The number you need is also 0345 the, um, the good news is there's a prize. The bad news is there's only one. But there's one every week. So if you don't win it, well, I don't know. You're on like... Well, anyway, my favourite contributor of the week will win a Mystery Hour board game. And uh, you can find out more about the Mystery Hour board game at mysteryhour.co.uk. You can find the full terms and conditions for what is, despite appearances, an actual bona fide grown-up radio competition at lbc.co.uk. And I think that concludes the housework or the terms and conditions of this segment. So we can crack on with it now. Uh, my decision is final. That's all I'd say. I just pick my favourite. And uh, there is no rhyme or reason necessarily to the rhyme or reason. But it's all mine. Eight minutes after 12 is the time. Our mystery hour is underway. Oli is in Gdansk. That's in Poland, that is. Question or answer, Oli? Uh, question, please, James. Carry on, mate. I just want to know why um, people like myself, we get bitten a lot by mosquitoes, but other people don't seem to get bitten much. I'm guessing it's something to do with your blood, but I don't know. I, 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 I presume we've done this before because it's a bit of a classic, but I, I can't remember the answer. And, and you, you, one of my daughters has a terrible time and the other one is absolutely fine. It is, it's really weird, isn't it? You can sleep in the same yeah. room as someone and... Uh, one of you will get bitten to business, and one of you won't. I find paler people get bitten more. Are you quite pale? No, I'm. I'm quite dark skinned, but oh. I don't know why I get. I get riddled in mosquito bites, and nobody else does. Well, there goes that theory. Then I just. It's nothing to do with paleness. The producer gets bitten a lot. Uh, I yes, don't. I don't. I don't get bitten a lot, and I'm very pale. Got a classic Irish complexion, so it can't be that. Something in our blood. So let's put it on the list, shall we? Why does, uh, not just you. Obviously, I'm going to ask, why do some people get a bit more than others by, by mosquitoes? Not just only. What are you doing in Gdansk, if you don't mind me asking? Well, it's complicated. It's, uh, I work He's a spy. Off He's, a spy. Tax, He's a spy. Tax He's a spy. Yeah. He's going to be in all sorts of trouble. What are you doing ringing radio stations? You're undercover. Ten minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, uh, Daniel is in Ashby de la Zouche. Who is oh, the famous that. person from Ashby de la Zouche that I always forget, Daniel? Oh, I wouldn't know. I have no idea. You've got no, no, you can't think of anyone famous from Ashby de la Zouche? No, 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 no. I'm only working here. I don't live here. All right. I, just, I, just, I mean, I, I don't upset the whole of Ashby de la Zouche. I used to think it was Rick Astley, but he's from somewhere else with a similar name. Anyway, I digress. Question or answer? Question. Carry on. Right then. Uh, Preparation H is a popular oil cream. Oh, you Lord. This is, this has taken a turn already, hasn't it? Yes. Well, well it is. The I mean, it's a pile. Cream. It's a pile cream. I don't think there's such a thing as an unpopular pile cream, is there? So, the, <laughs> so, so the popular, the popular is redundant in that sentence. 
<laughs> there's, there's, there's an active ingredient in it, yeah. and it's uh, and I've looked at it in it. It's absolutely baffled me, and it's shark's liver oil. How would somebody find out <laughs> that shark's liver oil is good for taking the pain away from a certain affliction? Shall I say shark's liver oil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would it be like a fisherman on a boat one day? It's and unlikely. Like, it's, it's Adrian Mole, on. mate. It's Adrian Mole. <laughs> Adrian Mole is from Ashby de la Zeus. That's who I'm thinking of. Yes. And he's not even real. He's a (laughs) a fictional famous person. So I don't think that a fisherman who was struggling with his (laughs) his knobby styles thought to himself, oh, that's a tasty looking shark's liver over there. I know what I'll do with that. That seems unlikely, doesn't it? That's the point that you're making. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so I've just been... I look at it and think, what, I, how, who would, no, why would they? I've got, even... a, th- I've got a theory. <laughs> Go on. No, I really have got a theory. So you might establish that a certain chemical is a, whatever, you know, like a shrinker. Okay. It has a, it has a, a, a dehydrating effect or whatever the yeah. correct technical term yeah. would be. Because some people apparently put pile cream around their eyes to get the bags under their eyes to diminish. Oh, really? An old makeup artist told me that. And yeah. imagine okay. imagine if the shark's liver is yeah. a well-known source of that chemical. Right, right. Well, you, you, you're already beat getting me there. to uh, get- any idea I ever had. I'm getting there. And, yeah, there, yeah. and therefore, you just put shark's liver in the ingredients, but what you're really saying is, that in, that that shrinking that pile okay. shrinking chemical. Okay. That's, I'm yeah, not giving I'll myself. Take, a, I'm not. I'm, no, well, you can take that. I'm not giving myself a round of applause for that old toot. <laughs> I shall put it on the list. That's a lovely question. Did, and, and you're you're 100 percent certain of this. You have read the ingredients. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely baffled. Well, you would be. Yeah. Shark's yeah. liver. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, shark yeah. liver oil. Shark liver oil. Yeah, that's what it said on the ingredients. I believe you. I mean, I'll, I'll be a very odd thing to make up. Other ointments with different preparation with different ingredients, but that was the one on preparation H. <sighs> well, you live and learn, frankly. <coughs> you, you live and learn. Thank you, Daniel. Why? Why? What? How? And sharks. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. It's thirty minutes after twelve. Just for the record, Adrian Moll was raised was born and raised in Leicester, but I believe later in life, possibly when his parents converted a pigsty to live in. I think that he settled in Ashby de la Zouch. But that, that is where I got it from. And quite right, too. I, these are my favourite listeners, the ones whose minds work in eccentric and cu- as, as curious a way as mine. Rick Astley is from Newton Le Willows. So you can see why I got Ashby de la Zouch mixed up with Newton Le Willows, because they're both a bit French, innit? Nick's in. No, shut up. Nick's also in Ashby de la Zouch. That's it, Ashby de la Zouch. I think you're thinking of maybe Lord Hastings. I'm William not. the Conqueror's sidekick? No, oh, okay, that's the only famous person I Good can Lord, think of. Good Lord, really? Um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I'm, I'll go and see Daniel later. Um, oh, well, well right. I guess. I, that takes three yeah. wait years for a call from Ashby de la Zouchnik, and then you two come along at once. Is, oh, I, no, I'm not thinking. I was thinking of Adrian Mole, I think, actually. Oh, well. Um, anyway. Right, question about tea, if I can. Tea? So, when you make tea, yes. I like my tea a lovely rich orange colour. Yes. So, quite strong. Yes. And I will travel with a Donald, flask. Tr- Donald Trump fan, I'll... are you, Nick? Is that, is that... <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Carry only on. Way is ethic. Carry on. Um, so the only the only reason I thought I'd call in, I yes. use a flask a lot because yes. I travel for five hours driving my train. Yes. And by the time I get there, the last cup of tea will always look a bit grey. And I notice this as well when I have it at home. If I forget to drink it, come back two hours later in the microwave, it's gone a bit grey. So I suppose my question is, why does the tea change colour and taste worse after time, is it going to be the milk, the tea, or both? And is it going to be oxidisation, enzymes? enzymes? What is the thing? Enzymes. Going to be, I'll tell you what we can all agree on, Nick. It's going to be science, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, yes, so, I really like your... Long, um, it's going to be yeah, science. So you've got a nice, a rich... I, I, some people may object to the orange, but I know what you mean, that sort of rich russet colour. Absolutely. Of a, russet, of a, love, a yeah. lovely cup of tea. And then by yep. close of play on the trains, it's gone a sort of it's gone a duller grey colour. Dull, dull, and it's just it's just it builder's tea. Different. It's just normal tea. You're not an old grey man or anything like that. No, no, no. Normal, normal tea. No brands, but very strong. 
I only ask because I think Earl Grey possibly leans a little bit towards the grey from the from the get go compared to a normal tea, compared to a breakfast tea. Or, 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 no, this is but this perfectly is all by the normal by. tea. Right, you're on. Why does next tea turn grey? And uh, why does Ollie keep getting bitten by mosquitoes? Obviously, both of these questions have universal applications way beyond the two gentlemen that asked them. As for Daniel's question, it, that, that too is both personal and public at the same time. Uh, thank you. It's 12.16. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.18 is the time. Why do mosquitoes prefer some people to others? How did they discover, or why is there shark liver oil in hemorrhoid treatment? And why does tea go grey after it has been brewed, made and milked? 0345 6060973. I like all of those questions. Bryony is not in Ashby de la Zouche. She's in Bow. Bryony, question or answer? It's a question, please, James. Carry on. So, I was wondering mm. if there is any science behind why couples can end up looking like each other over time. Oh, uh, well, I, I, I think that I've read some stuff about couples who, who start off looking a little bit like each other. Mm. But you, you think that it can, you can start off looking very different and then end up beginning to look like each other over time. Yeah. Is this what's happened Even to you? Um, well, my mum says that I've been with my partner for 12 years yeah. and she, every time she sees us, she says, oh, you, you do really look like each other, but we don't have similar features, really. Yeah, yeah well, you say that, but did your mum say that from the start? No. Are you sure? Yes. You're not manipulating the facts to fit your original theory? I do not believe I am. Okay. I think, I mean, mm -hmm. that... Do you suffer from mimicry ever? Mm, I don't think so. Have you ever heard me talking to an Irish person on the programme? Oh, I know what you mean. So, I'm, and my accent changes slightly, or if I'm in control of the accent, I find myself saying grand a lot for no particular reason. Yeah, I don't tend to do that. Well, you don't notice also, that you're doing it, because I think it's called empathetic mimicry. So it doesn't necessarily speak to physical resemblance, but you might be in, mm. uh, uh, subconsciously mirroring each other's mannerisms, which is, when you think about it, uh, is going to have an impact upon how you reach the eyes of an observer. You're going to seem similar. Okay. That's part of it, I reckon. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, it's true as well, but it's not a definitive answer. We need to hear from someone with some mm. qualifications. Yeah. Who is okay. more offended by your mother's observation, you or your partner? Um, I don't think either of us are offended, but oh. it does have quite a bit of a bigger nose than me. I'm glad we've... Yeah. Thank you, Bryony. It's 21 minutes after 12. James is in Inverness. James, question or answer? Good morning, James. It's a question. Carry on. So, gone are the days of opening your car door with a key. Yes. We use electronic fobs, etc. So, what I want to know is, when you are quite a distance away from your car ah, and yes. your fob doesn't work. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and then when you put it to your head and look at your car, it works. So you can be quite a distance away and it doesn't work. Put your fob to your head, look at your car and it unlocks or locks, whichever you want to be. I'm guessing there's some conductivity or something there, but I don't know the answer. It, it's. I, I think your head is a bell. Hello? Hello? I think your head is a bell. Oh, that was last week's show. Uh, there's a, there's a, it works as a bell. It works as a, like a, you know, an amplifier. It's a bell. Right. Okay. So you put so it. That's it. Uh, yeah. I, 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 this was. Do you know? Someone else is going to have to double check this. In fact, I don't think you can double check it. It's all lost in the mist of time. I think this was on a very, very, very early mystery hour. I think it was on was one it? of the very, very first. Mystery hour is this. Well, right, right, still in the goal. <laughs> right back in the day. And, and and the answer is that if you think about it, so your brain is quite mushy, so it's not going to yeah. interfere much with the kind of amplifying qualities of your skull. Yeah. And therefore you put it on your... I think the best place to put it might be under your chin, actually, and then open your mouth, would you believe? And then it... Really? It, yeah. And then it, uh, 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 like that. 
I'll take your word for it. I'm not going to try that in the I, car park in Tesco's at the weekend, but, you know. I, 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 do people remember it, but are they actually remembering? I think they did it on Top Gear as well. That might be the qualifications. That might be where, right. it, it might be where they're... But they're, that, so I'm going to take a round of applause for that because I've had a swing at all the questions well so done. far. Well done. And I, I, if I'm wrong, I will revise and, and, and re, okay. re, refer. There's something to do, if not the head, then the jawbone itself is the... Uh, but it is, yeah, it is uh, essentially magnifying whatever it is you're sending to the car. That's going to be all right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll nice that one. No, all thank right, you, James. No worries. No, 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 thanks, James. Top man, thank round of applause for me, please, Keith. Thank you very much. Uh, Marie's in Harringay. Marie, question or answer? Uh, question, please. Carry on. Um, why are there so many donkey sanctuaries in the UK if we don't really use donkeys anymore um, for work or for beaches? And obviously you have them for Christmas nativity and stuff. But there seems to be an ever-increasing amount of donkey sanctuaries and people wanting donkeys to be adopted. But I don't know why, where all why, these donkeys are coming from. Why, why do you hate donkeys? I don't hate donkeys. I well, love that's donkeys. how you're coming across. I just worry. I just don't know I just don't know why there's so many sanctuaries. What do people use them for? Like Sometimes you use alpacas for protecting sheep. But what do people use donkeys for? And why are there so many in sanctuaries? Um, are you sure there's a growing number of sanctuaries? I'm not sure there's a growing number, but I'm looking at a map. And yeah, so, am I, a, so am I, yeah, so am I, so am I. Yeah, and hang on, let's, would it work? I was just crossing over the map to France and Belgium, and there don't seem to be any there, but I don't know, I think that probably is more to do with the nature of the software on the map than it is with a shortage of donkeys in um, in continental Europe. They, they might eat them in some countries. They eat horse, don't they? Um, they do. You've got the donkey sanctuary, the donkey sanctuary there. You've got a donkey yeah. sanctuary there. They're all over the place. Well, in a way, I wondered whether you'd answered your own question at the beginning, Marie, when you said that we don't use them, we don't put them to work as much as we used to, in which case you'd need the sanctuaries, but then and then they breed. That's a fair point. It's quite a good answer, that. Actually. Well, I, I don't actually know if they still do donkey rides on beaches. Anyway, there seems more sanctuaries than I think there are working donkeys. Unless people have them as pets and then give them away, but that's quite sad. I haven't seen a uh, donkey at the beach for quite a long time. And I go to... I'm a big fan of English seaside towns, so I, I don't... I mean, they must still exist somewhere, but there's a lot in... Um, What's the what's the island called with a big windmill on top? It's Hydra. There's a lot in Hydra in Greece. Hydra, mm -hmm. H Y D R A. Because there's no cars there, no cars uh, at all on the whole island. So there's a lot of donkeys there, but they're not going to end up in a donkey sanctuary in Dorset, are they? Well, they do that sometimes with rescue dogs and things. No one's going to bring don't... a donkey back from. Uh, I just want to know where all the donkeys come from. Gonna, but where do it, so that is your question? Where do all the yeah. donkeys come from? Yeah. Uh, well, what what if they just mummy and daddy donkeys end up in the sanctuary and and they raise a lot of money? I saw a statistic once about the amount of money that's donated to one big donkey sanctuary, and it was it was it was a, it was an eye watering amount in comparison with other charities as well. So it's in their interests well, to keep going. Yeah. They're not going to euthanize the donkeys, are they? And no. I, I don't know if they would new to them, and if they don't new to them, then. By definition, a donkey sanctuary is a perfect business model. Yeah. Because they keep creating well, more product. Donkey sanctuary is a way to keep UK or European breed donkeys alive. Yeah. I just don't know. Not I just do want I. to know. Well, we're all wondering now. Western, <laughs> Western Supermare, if you, if you want a donkey ride, they've still got them there. Okay. Well, you don't sound that excited. I thought you liked donkeys. Well, I do like donkeys, but I am an adult and I may be too heavy for a donkey. Clee Thorpes? <laughs> yep. Uh, Dungeness. Well, you've got them in city farms as well. You have? There's um, a lot of donkey. Now you come to think of it, they're bloody everywhere. They are everywhere. And they rock them out for Christmas nativity. They do sometimes. I, I, we had one at the Corum Christmas Carol concert where I, where I have the honour of doing the uh, doing the duties every year. But I, I don't, they poo a lot, don't they? So you've got to be a little bit careful about where you let them go and where you don't let them go in a, in a, in a church-based context. But, uh, th th right, let's have a look. All right, Philip's written, I am a trustee of a donkey sanctuary. James is so wrong. What have I said that could be wrong? 
I don't think I've said anything that could be wrong. Well, maybe the bit about breeding, maybe. In which case, the question becomes even more pertinent. Where do all the donkeys come from? 03456060973. I could now spend 20 minutes reading out my inbox of all the places where you can still get a donkey ride in the United Kingdom. Blackpool, for example. Great Yarmouth. Really, Caroline? I've been to Yarmouth a lot of times. I don't remember seeing the donkeys, but you were there last weekend. Western Supermare coming top of the list. That seems to be the most popular uh, donkey. Uh, based locale. Um, on we go. Uh, 1228. Uh, John's in Croydon. John, question or answer? Question, James. Good Carry morning. on. Uh, so, I'm trying to distinguish the difference between a town pigeon and a wood pigeon. Now, I'm didn't, not. Didn't we do this answer. last week? Oh, I, I missed it and okay. I went over it a couple of times with a couple of juicers, so I don't know. No, if, it's um, not your fault. I just. What did we do last week? There. The difference between a wood pigeon and a. And a well, I mean, I even did impressions. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I missed that, James. But what I'm trying to distinguish yes. between is a uh, wood pigeon and, say, a feral pigeon that would live in a town. Now, they're the same species, but their one has a distinct look to it that makes it look feral and like it has been in the town. And right, you're talking you about how it? they look, not how they sound. Yeah. So Fair now, enough, carry on. With, with that, what makes them start to gain that appearance? Do you see what I'm saying? Is it the food? Is it the location that they're in? Why does a wood pigeon... When inhabiting a um, more built-up area, more yeah. urban area, why does it then start to change its appearance? Well, I think it's obvious. Enlighten me. Well, what do you, what do urban pigeons live on? Chips uh, mostly, grit, gravel, and all, all sorts. Chips. Yeah, but you'd say that they that they have everything they need in order to. Yeah, but what their would you look like if you lived on chips? <laughs> well, if I took a look in the mirror, James, I'd probably get a good idea. But um, and and if you lived on woodland fruits, yeah, you, I, I I do get that to it. But I'm saying then, why is it that in what is it then, then that they are consuming or not consuming that would then cause a discoloration in their feathers, or is that not? So is it a discoloration, in, like, or is it just a sort of bit of a greasy film? Well, that would be the distinguishing, but and that's something that I haven't been able to clarify. Chips. And, it's all down to chips, too. It's got, it was down to diet and probably a bit of stress as well. I don't. I, so what you're saying is, why do city pigeons look a right old state? Well, well, country pigeons look lovely. Yeah, and then is it something that you could, for example, a nice looking wood pigeon could fly into a town? How long would it then take for them to start looking like that? Not, but they're not, not identical, natural, are they? So there are going to be some physical differences that are innate. A wood pigeon and a city pigeon, they're not the same. They're not exactly the same, are they? But they are the same species. There's no. No, they're uh, different it's not, species. It's not a dove or something. But they're different example. species. So then, what would the different species be? If it, it is a wood well, like, pigeon, just what, don't live there. It, like, is, what's the species? Is dog a species or is is poodle a species? But, well, dogs the species, and then you have different breeds. Oh, so they are the same species then? They're different breeds of pigeon. Yeah, yeah. That, okay. But then, with that distinction, like going between that and a dove, say for example, because they're, they're much bigger. Defined. Wood pigeons are much bigger than town pigeons. But there's no definition in terms of like they're not a whole separate genetic base or anything like that. This is as this is something okay. environmentally. That so you mean why changes. do they look so rough? Not different. There's reasons why they'd look different that are biological or genetic. But why do they look so rough? Yeah, quite right. Okay, I, I want you to apologise to Tess in Acton. She says, please, could you ban pigeon-related questions on mystery? I'm terrified of them. Even the mention of them gives me the creeps. Many thanks. That's Tess in Acton. She might have feel a bit different to a wood pigeon. I don't know. Do you know, mate? She hates them all. Come on, say sorry. Uh, I do apologise. There we go. Sound like you mean it next time. Twelve thirty-one is the time. Um, Amelia Cox has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. I've got some more pigeon-related content for you. So Tess, I don't know if you want to go and make a cup of tea, but I, w I went to. Uh, I was at the cricket on Saturday. Had a lovely time. Thank you to Adil Ray for inviting us. But I was with David Arnold, the composer, who is a really lovely bloke. I've had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times, and he's rung in a lot, of course, on Mystery. He's helped us out on many occasions with music and sort of audio-related questions. Um, and he. I've forgotten what the exact thing was, but he, he and his partner have a way of telling the difference between wood, pigeon, wood pigeons and other pigeons, which came up last week on the programme. And it's something like this. I do love pigeons, I do. That's how the wood pigeon goes. I do, I do love pigeons, I do. I do, so I do love pigeons, I do. That's a good way to remember it. I don't know why I went Irish. Ah, it's grand. I don't. I've no idea why I went Irish. That I do love pigeons. I do. It, you should try doing that without. Go on, do it now. See if you can do that without doing Irish. Go on. 
I do. I do love pigeons, I do. I do. Anyway, uh, why do they all look so different? Uh, more questions, please. Russell is in battle, which is quite apt because, of course, Nicky and Ashley de la Zouche referred to Lord Hastings. See how my brain works? That's weaving, that is, like Donald Trump. Question or answer, Russell? It's a question, sir. Carry on. Um, I have been a long time lurker, first time caller. So I'm really nervous. Oh, it's thank only you me. Watching. It's only me. Really? Thank That's you. That's why I'm nervous. Don't be absurd. So, Carry on. Thank you for doing thank what you. you're doing. Thank so, you. so, a quick question. My yeah. my wife is an amazing cook. I oh. got fat. Mm. So, uh, she ma- what she does is she gets recipes and she makes it her own. Her own. So, like say I got Miss J. Moore brands, uh, you know, broccoli, yes. so the the Brussels sprouts and the Saint Augustine cheese, and mm. I instead I put rock for. Mm. Now, because of that, I made an app for her on I uh, on the iPhones so that she can store her recipes. Oh. But eventually she told me to make it public, so I made it public, I made it free so people can share and share recipes with one another because such an app is not existent. Yeah. So, so I made one for her. My question is, can a recipe be copyrighted? So if I took Miss James O'Brien's recipe and I just say I put Rockford instead, Will Miss James O'Brien come back to me and say, "Hey, you're t- taking a you know royalty out of my recipes, uh, this is, and start suing me, or is a recipe actually open for everybody forever?" That's a very good question. I, I, I mean, it, it's going to have been published, isn't it? So if it it's is, been yes. published, it would have had a. If it's in a recipe book, then there will be a form of copyright attached to it. But I yeah, mean, but some I recipes. Say, take your recipe, and I just change it a little bit. Then you'd be fine. No, then you'd be exactly. fine. Then I think you'd be fine. I, so, I mean, you couldn't copyright a carbonara, could you, or or, or uh, something that people have been making for it. So I, I, I wonder where the lines are. I wonder what the rules are. Because in the music industry, if you take this and you just sample it even a little, you will get done. You, you, yeah, you, you will. You. you will. But in the recipe, you could take you know, say Brussels. I need to try that anyway. Have you not so tried it? Have, have you not, not tried yet, it? I have not Ooh. made that. Ooh. I have to. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. A few chestnuts I say as I well. Put Rockford because my wife likes Rockford, but yeah, you know, it doesn't melt. Really the, it doesn't melt the same because the Santa Girl, you get a creamy one. You see, you don't don't buy the hard one. Buy the creamy one. It comes in a pot. It's like really quite liquidy, mm, yes. and it, it, you can see you're lo- loving it. You can taste it already, can't you? And it coats yes, the sprout. Yes, I made it up for her, and when people share uh, their recipes, I'm wondering if people get in trouble for, for putting recipes up there. And I don't, I don't know what the rules are on recipe copyrights. What a wonderful mm. question. Would you like to advertise the app, Russell, or not? Or does it, is if it, you don't mind, I would love it. Thank you. Carry on. It's called munyamiki.com. It's M-N-A-M-K-Y. Dot com. Manyamiki means yummy in a in a Slovak language because my wife is Slovak. So in, 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 for, in love to her, I just made it for That's her. so romantic. And you made that for her. Did she know what you were yes. going to call it before you made it? Um, well, uh, That's no. so romantic. <laughs> oh, look at you. That's gorgeous, that is. And to be fair, in, in, in response to the amount of meals she's cooked you, it's not that impressive. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> as a self-contained act of love, it's rather beautiful, that. How do you pronounce it again? Manyamiki, so it's M-N-A-M-K-Y. M-K-Y. M-K-Y. dot com. Yeah, if you go to the website, then you can download. Yeah, it's free for everybody, and it's like just full of lovely stuff. adverts. No, not adverts. Not, recipes. It's not, full of lovely not, recipes. Just recipes. Yes. Yeah, no, no. I don't know why I said adverts. I got, I got, I got confused. I got worried actually. Manyamiki, Manyamiki. dot com. Thank you, Russell. What is the rules? What are the rules regarding? Recipe copyrights, and will people get into trouble if they steal my recipes that I sometimes share on the show out of the kindness of my heart? Thank you, Russell. Sam's in East Grinstead. Sam, question or answer? Answer. Carry on. Uh, it was to the question around why feral pigeons. Hang on, so sorry, nasty. wait, just one second. Tess, sorry, Tess, uh, we're going back to the pigeons. You might want to go and get a biscuit to go with your cup of tea. Carry on, Sam. Uh, answer to why feral pigeons look so manky. Yes, that's is, a good um, word. That's the word we want. <laughs> I, I, I quite like them. Um, but, but essentially, it's a result of many thousands of years of human breeding. So yes. the wild progenitor of the feral pigeon is the rock dove, right. which is Columba livia. Yes. And, um, and for at least 2,000 years plus, we have bred those selectively, line breeding, they call it, for inter alia genetic features such as unique plumage. And then once those pigeons escaped and they are then allowed to crossbreed with each other again, those unique plumages cross with each other and result in a whole uh, spectrum of different plumages that probably weren't in, in expected by their original breeders. Some of them still look like their original progenitors. So, so you, you get you get you get an odd that. you get an odd pigeon that is bossing it. 
yeah, yeah. Occasionally they look like what they're supposed to look like. And if you go to some places like the Canary Islands, you might actually still see some of those wild progenitors. But generally, really? globally now, they all look the same. And it's not just that they look manky. They've been bred to do these amazing behavioural uh, characteristics. And so one of the most famous ones are the tumblers, where these birds will fly up and tumble down in these exaggerated uh, nuptial displays, all because of the line breeding by humans. Wow. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, Sam. I wasn't expecting quite such a detailed answer to that question. What are your qualifications, dare I ask? Uh, nerd ornithologist and an environment consultant. You can't say nerd ornithologist. Yeah, I wear it with pride. No, no, but you can't say that. Think about the opportunity you're missing linguistically. Uh, nerdithologist? No, bird nerd. <laughs> Oh, dear. Come no, on. My portmanteau was it's much a, better. It's not bird nerd. You're a bird nerd. I love it. Round okay. of applause for I'll Sam the it. bird nerd. I'm a bit of a bird nerd, but compared to Sam, I'm I'm a very, very, very early doors bird nerd. Uh, Simon's in Southampton. Simon, question or answer? Question, James, please. Carry on, Simon. Uh, right, let me try and put this as well as I can. You take your so, time, mate. You take your time. <laughs> when we have a change of prime minister... And their first task is to write the letter of last resort. Yes. The question is, how do they get that letter to the submarine? And the second part of the same question is, what would happen in the meantime if something was to happen? Because there would presumably be a gap where there's no information because they couldn't use the previous one because it's been directed from a person who's not now prime minister. Yeah, I think you've. I think. I think. I think you might have answered the question in the in in the question. So I think oh. that I don't think the letter gets changed until they dock. Until they come, right. until they dock, and I think that the old letter stands until that happens. Uh, okay, but, but then do the guys in the submarine sort of like when they get the new one? Do they open the old one just to see what it says? I, well, you're not allowed another question. Although oh. I do, I do share. It. Now you've asked it, I do actually share your curiosity about that. <laughs> but I, 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 there's another little bit of me that's thinking, what on earth? Where did I get that from? Why did I just say that out loud? But I, I, but surely, presumably, unless it is in 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 uh, doctrine, um, the, the period between the letters being changed over. Then they're not. They're, what they're just for the benefit of Keith? Prime Minister. For the benefit of Keith, what is a letter of last resort? Are you asking me? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's where the Prime Minister gets uh, shepherded into a little room, and they have to write a letter to the commanders of the nuclear. But what does trident. it say? Well, he knows. What? It, it, well, it, well it, it, it gives directions to what the commander of the submarine needs to do in the event of the, l losing contact or the, the unthinkable happens when nuclear strike. Uh, uh, and it so they've the, lost contact with base. Yeah, basically, if we've had a nuclear strike, what does the, what does the commander do? Because he's not got anybody to ask. So the letter tells him what well, to so do. Probably the letter's always the same, isn't it? It's just the signature well, at the bottom that changes. Oh, no, because well, yeah, you I might have know, had it. You could imagine a prime minister who would say never use the nuclear missiles ever. Or some would say refer to America, or some would say Check go it. for it. Yeah. Or you, you just never know. But, I right. wanna, yeah. but yeah, so that is it, basically. So letter of last resort. Well, they've got to get it to the submarine somehow. So how do they? I don't. Well, I think they wait till they come back to base, uh, any base, you know. I mean, what's the longest they'll be at sea for? Roughly. Well, no one knows where it is, do they? Well, they know where it is. They've got radars or sonars. So won't show up on that, will it? Because otherwise there's no point in having well, a... They've got their own sonar, so they know where they are, so they know where it is. Well, these are all interesting um, i tell you what, points. I would have thought submarines were such a fertile area for exploration, but I shall put it on the list. Um, we didn't have that question last week. Someone's listening on catch-up. Thank you, Simon. Uh, it's 12.45. James O'Brien on LBC. 1248 is the time. I think some people are getting me mixed up with the news agents. I think they got the question about the letters of last resort on a Q&A that they did shortly after the general election. So you didn't hear it here. We may have done it before, but we haven't done it recently. To clarify, it's, it's, it's kind of what happens if the government is destroyed. Then you're, you're off, you're miles away in a nuclear submarine and you open up the letter. When you realise the government back in London has been destroyed, like the country has been... Uh, conquered, overcome, attacked. You open it up and decide what to do. Do you bomb London to get rid of the 
invade? I don't know. But what happens after an election to swap it around? Uh, did the pigeons? Uh, what's the copyright situation regarding recipes? Where do all the donkeys come from? Why do couples start to look the same as they get older? Do you know the Chinese, Bryony, have a word for that? Um, I, I, I checked with my friend who sent me this because I wasn't going to try and pr pronounce that word live on the radio. I could have got into all sorts of bother. It turns out it's pronounced Fu Qi Xiang. Fu Qi Xiang is a Chinese uh, a phrase to describe similarities in the face and or appearance of an old couple. So Bryony was asking without realising it about Fu Qi Xiang. Why does Nick's tea go grey? Uh, why is there shark liver oil in uh, pile cream? Who the heck discovered that? And why do mosquitoes prefer some people to others? Neil's in Glasgow. Neil, question or answer? Answer. Carry on. Yes, well, I'm slightly nervous because one, first time caller, yes. and two, I'm going to give a different answer oh. uh, to yours on key fobs. Oh, that was the only round of applause um, I took. Stuart's inquiry, live <laughs> on the radio. Go on then, you fill your boots. You almost certainly um, know more about this subject than I do. Yeah, well, I'm saying it's height. Purely oh, to do with height. Okay. Um, and if you think of radio transmitters, the most common these days is mobile phone masts, and they're up at a height. And other radio transmitters are at a height. And actually, years ago, we talked about this in Top Gear, very early uh, with Jeremy Clarkson, etc., on Top Gear. And I went and tested it. And <clears throat> so you don't need to yet, put it anywhere near your head. You just, if you hold it above your head, it's going to no, be even more effective. Yeah, if you put it at the, the end of your arm and put your arm straight up, you can be even further away from your car. Why? Why well, how does it work? Um, well, uh, the kind of frequencies that they use, uh, it's line of sight. The, the radio signal goes in a straight line. So if you've got it down low, it goes low. But if you've got it up high, it will go down the way as well. So the reach of it is uh, further away. Yeah, okay. Qualifications, you've tested it for yourself? I tested it myself. I have a degree in electrical and electronic engineering. Oh, I'd have opened with that. I, I have previously worked in the telecoms and defence. Yeah, I'd have opened with that rather than you saw it on top. <laughs> <laughs> have a round of applause, Neil. Lovely stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Aidan's in Bromley. Aidan, question or answer? I need some other answers. If, you, if you've got an answer for me, ring now, you'll get through. 0345 606 Go on, Aidan. Answer, James. Carry on, mate. Uh, donkey sanctuaries. Yes. They import them. Oh. They rescued them from around the world. From places where they are used still for labour and what yeah, have you. exactly. Extraction. Qualifications? <laughs> I used to live near Sidmouth Donkey Sanctuary, and I'm pretty sure I've had to drag my girlfriend out of there before. And that's what they would do. So, Keir Starmer's, Keir Starmer's mum had a donkey sanctuary. Um, he has a donkey sanctuary. Uh, no, not anymore. She's not. She's No, he, no his mum. I said his mum. I said Keir Starmer's <laughs> mum has a donkey sanctuary. Honestly, you wow. spend hours not listening to the programme, and then when you start to correct me, you're saying, correcting me for things I've not even said out loud. Not you, <laughs> Aidan. I'm just having a, bit of a, got everything. I'm having a bit of a staff meeting. Uh, a donkey sanctuary. Uh, yeah, okay. That makes so like the ones in, that I've seen in Greece, or uh, presumably they might still use them down mines or something in some parts of the world. Who knows what you do with a donkey? Yeah. And, of course, the retired ones from the beaches that you've got no longer got any use for. They could be, so they're all... I wonder what, what's the furthest afield in Sidmouth that the donkey had come from? Do you remember? Oh, I think the Middle East, I think they come mm, from. Shut up. Are you serious? Honestly, yeah. They, they literally extract them like military extraction. They come on a boat. Natural, right? but, and that's why they need so much money. Yeah, and all the little old ladies, you know, leave all their money to the donkey sizes. It, it, it is an extraordinary statistic, actually, which I probably should have shared by now because I've referenced its extraordinary -ness countless times. But it's got you a round of applause, Aidan, so it wasn't all wasted time. Around the donkey yeah. sanctuary with your I can't bill. believe after all my calls I've finally got on for a question about donkeys. There we go. There, there, that's the nature <laughs> of mystery, <laughs> mate. You can't predict anything. It's entirely in the lap of the gods. 12.53 is the time. Christo's in Prague. Christo, question or answer? Uh, answer, James. Carry on. Uh, mosquitoes. It's yes. the only job I've ever been fired from, put it this way. Go and on. it's for exactly this It's for exactly this reason. Really? Uh, the mosquitoes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, mosquitoes bite you because of your firstly your blood type, yeah. bacteria on your skin, as well as the clothing that you wear. Um, and this could mean your blood type could just be the opposite of the person you're laying next to. 
uh, the clothing that you wear therefore causes different bacteria growing on your skin. And I know this sounds disgusting. Everybody's got bacteria on their skin. That's just the way it happens. Uh, This could cause a reaction, and therefore they just lack a fondness of it. Uh, And they will just attract to you more than the person next to you. Uh, My parents had this problem when I was growing up. My wife has this problem now. I've obviously got a bad bacteria because I just don't get bitten, mate. So I'm, in a way, I'm fortunate. Um, what and you live and learn. What, how, what, what, how did you get fired? I don't understand. Uh, ba- 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 basically, I went to. A, I used to do pest control oh, uh, in South Africa. It was one of the first jobs I ever had. Okay. Um, I went to a cockroach, uh, cockroach infestation. Helped this woman with this, and she was like, "Why am I getting bitten by mosquitoes?" And yes. my husband not. Yes. I made a light-hearted joke oh, right. to her, and yeah. I said, "Darling, you probably just like sweeter than your husband oh. because yeah, he might be right. bitter. Yeah. He might be bitter." Like a light-hearted joke. That's okay. She I was worried then because yeah, you know what and, it's and, like. Someone says light-hearted joke. Someone else says that's incredibly offensive. Yes, no, but that this wasn't. Was a that was fine. Joke. That was fine. She she laughed. Her husband oh. laughed. Her husband was laughing more than her. Yes, because obviously she's the one getting eaten. Yes, and she was like, "Yes, it's because you better, you miserable." Mm. I got back to the office later. I was only nineteen, maybe twenty years old at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the governor was like, "Oh no, no." Uh, you can't say that. You need to sell them this product. And I said, mate, all, all you want to do is just make money from these people. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it could be. Uh, and well, this has taken a turn. I, so it was yeah. nothing to do with the uh, be, with the with the nature of the comment, the banter. No. He was cross no. that you hadn't flogged them something to. Exactly. I didn't sell them another product. Well, I can't and... see his point. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, it's, it's... Uh, uh... Well, well you, you, the next day, yeah. I went back with a thesis that I actually did for school. Right. Because I, I suffer from, from dyslexia. Okay. And I always used to do everything in sport, like every thesis I did in sport. Yes. Uh, and hmm? I was like, I said to, uh, one day I said to my teacher, I was like, my parents are getting bitten by mosquitoes and I'm not. Right. Why? He goes, go, go, to the, go to the library. This is way before internet, man. I'm 40, what, 47 years old. Um, I went, and he's like, go to the library, study it, and give me a little thesis. And I did a thesis on it, and right. those are the answers that actually did come out. But you didn't get your job thesis. back. No. Yeah, the next day, I went back with the thesis, dropped it off. Yeah. Uh, he read it. He phoned me the next day, tried to give me my job back. Oh. And I was just like, no. don't bother, mate. You can just, stick just your job, job where the sun don't shine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You've you got to tell him where to go after I, that. Well, you know once in I mean? a while, eh? And now you're in Prague. What a life. Yes, yeah, exactly. I'm going to give you a round of applause. Years, I, hang so on, I'm going to give you a round of applause because if I don't, I'm not sure you're ever going to stop talking, Christo. Cheers, buddy. All right, mate. Um, I think we've got a bit of an incident. It's 12.57. This is from Naz. Noz, sorry, Noz. The donkey sanctuary in Sidmouth does not import donkeys from around the world. I work for the donkey sanctuary, although not in the PR department. I thought I would jump on this quick just to stop false information going out. Please contact our PR team to find out about donkeys. I can't. It's against the rules of mystery hour. But now, oh no, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got its trousers on. Oh, Lord. Caleb's in Dagenham. Caleb, question or answer? Answer. Carry on. So the last resort letter. <laughs> I'm, so I'm going to give my qualifications now. I'm a ex Royal Navy warfare specialist on the submarine. I used to be on several submarines. Holy moly! <laughs> Thank God you're here. The um, the last resort letter is actually transmitted to the tech department. So like the people that do all the radar and sonars and that sort of stuff. But you are told to rendezvous with the fleet. They then get transferred with other supplies such as food, fuel, all of that sort of stuff. And oh, there so is it does parts. a ship to ship transfer. Yes. Oh, what a brilliant answer. How many people are in your role? How many warfare specialists on submarines are there at any one time? So we can work in between a crew of ten to fifteen of us. What, obviously. in the whole country, in the whole navy? No, in the whole navy there there'll be thousands. Thousands of warfare <laughs> submarine warfare specialists. The warfare specialist role doesn't differ that much between surface fleet and 
sudden having warfare, oh. the only thing that you'd have to learn is to torpedoes. So roughly how many would be submarine specialists? So submarine specialists, you're looking at about three to four hundred, maybe five max. But uh, Just yeah. for four submarines? Yes, that's just submarines. But there's only four? That is include, yeah, but that is including all the training stuff and all the simulation stuff. So that is people ready to go. I, I'm just going to have a word with the producer. I know they're not all on the submarine. Yes. <sighs> they're not all on the submarine. Jeez. You see what <laughs> I have to put up with, Kano? Seriously. Yeah. I'm just going to consult with Sheila Fogarty. Does he get a radio set for that? Does he Always. Get... Yeah? Yeah. Go on then. I'm Ray Liotta, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> oh, man. Poignant now. Great work, Caleb. Thank you. Thank you for your service also. Oh, poignant, son. As you remember, Jay, that Ray Liotta is no longer with us. It's an answer on the New York Times crossword last week. I got quite emotional. That's it for another week. Uh, I'm going to give it to Russell. Russell the recipe man. Or Russell the app man who's married to the recipe lady. Uh, for Mnamki. Mm, 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 the check word for yummy. I'll just check with Sheila. What's the check word for yummy again? How do you spell it? M A M N A M K Y, of course. Namki. M- no, it's got a Manamaki. 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 Uh, if you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Pair. <laughs> Frankly, why wouldn't you want to? You can also pause and rewind live radio as well as listen to a dizzying range of podcasts. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now it's Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC.